Hello and welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another long video. This time we're looking at Verity by my favorite author, Colleen Hoover. Rachel Oates is making me do this. But before we get into that two things, three things actually, like, comment and subscribe. Check out my trailer for my mockumentary here. This man plans crazily far ahead. He should just keep doing what he's doing. He's just being his best self. Well, I saw that date. It put me off my lunch. It's 2023, sweetie. Age is just the number. And it's there where the story gets interesting. Someone over there too. Come on, come on. And I know some of my morals might not be your morals. That's the way the world works. You'd literally be amazed how many people jump back into my life. That's what narcissists believe. They believe that they're the smartest person in the room and that he can fool everyone. So horrible, it was just... Is that so bad? I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sorry, I've got, I've, got, I've got... We need to find Paul and catch him before time runs out. This video is sponsored by My Heritage. My Heritage is a leading global family history and DNA service that makes exploring your family history easier than ever. How it works is you order a DNA testing kit, you swab your cheeks, you send it off and then wait for your DNA results to return. Your DNA results will reveal an ethnicity estimate and DNA matches. So I've just received my My Heritage DNA kit. Let's have a look and see what's inside. Remember to activate your DNA kit using the website myheritagedna.com forward slash setup. You have to activate your kit. And instructions. Cool. There's a clear step-by-step -step manual, so activate your kit online. Open the test kit and lay out the unopened swabs and vials on a clean surface. Is this table clean? Who knows? Always keep them guessing. Never let them know your next move. Cheek swabs. I'm sure we're all very well acquainted with these in the year 2023. So scrape the inside of one of your cheeks whilst rotating the swab for 30 to 60 seconds. Attractive, isn't it? Ugh, I just touched it with my tongue. I think I got makeup on it. Anyway, once you've done that, these are the little vials. Open one vial, insert the swab inside. Swab end down, obviously, dummy. Like so, and then break the swab, like so. Close the vial tightly. Then let's do the other cheek. I gotta catch a train in like 20 minutes. I just sit here at home doing this. <laughs> Repeat the process. Open the cap first. Now we wanna take both vials, place both files on the cotton pad in the clear plastic Ziploc bag. So I guess you just put them on like this. I'm not sure. Put them in the biohazardous bag. Are they saying that my saliva is biohazardous? Because that's just rude and probably true. Zip shut. Then mail the envelope at your postage expense to our DNA lab. They didn't send me a stamp? Outrageous. Envelopes come like pre-sticky now. You can't even lick them anymore. That was the best bit. I will receive the results of this within three to four weeks. So see you later. In addition to DNA testing, MyHeritage offers a platform that makes it easy to build your family tree and research your family history. It's a fun and easy way to discover your origins and you might find new relatives. You can also search for old family records among the 19 plus billion records that are on the MyHeritage platform. MyHeritage has also committed in its privacy policy to never sell or license genetic data. You are the sole owner of your DNA data. So it's been a few weeks and I finally received my DNA results. So let's check it out. Wait, what? Excuse. 1.6% English, 63% North and West European. What? Population of Northern and Western Europe includes mainly German, French, and Dutch people. H huh? I'm not English? What? But who am I if not English? What? 18.3% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. I knew that I was part Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. Huh? 1% English? I am actually bamboozled right now. I can't believe that. I knew that the rest of me was south asian but there's also west asian and central asian which is 
The South Asian part is India and Pakistan. I was aware of that. There's also a possibility of me being Kazakhstan, just a, just a little bit, just a smidge. Azerbaijan, Iraq, Turkey. I'm gobsmacked by the 1% English part. I'm confused and I shall be speaking to my grandparent when I can. What? European. Does this mean I get a European passport now? So make sure you get a DNA kit. Use the special link in my description box and use the coupon code Elise for free shipping. As an added bonus, you can start a 30-day free trial of MyHeritage's best subscription for family history research and enjoy a 50% discount if you decide to continue it. Thank you, MyHeritage, for sponsoring today's video. I can't put this off any longer, so I guess let's just get on with it. Chapter 1. Someone cracks their head on the sidewalk. Boy, I hope it's me. I closed my eyes before his head went under the tire, but I heard it pop like the cork of a champagne bottle. All right, Coho, I see you. Trying something different, bit of thriller. Boy, I hope it doesn't just dissolve into abusive men and bad sex scenes. I spin around to move away from the accident to find a place to take a breath, but the crosswalk sign now says walk and the thick crowd takes heed, making it impossible for me to swim upstream in this Manhattan river. Some don't even look up from their cell phones as they pass right by the accident. I stop trying to move and wait for the crowd to thin. Yeah, right, Colleen Hoover. People wouldn't stop to look at someone's brains everywhere. It's... Oh yeah, trigger warning. It's a Colleen Hoover book. It's way more likely that people would start taking pictures and filming the accident and putting it onto like, I don't know, TikTok or something rather than ignore it. Colleen Hoover. If you want to say something about how desensitized people are, then go for that angle instead. Three, maybe four people are assisting them. A few are led by their morbid curiosities, filming the gruesome scene with their phones. Knew it. Good one, Coho. Thank you for taking my advice. But here in Manhattan, a pedestrian struck by a vehicle happens so often, it's not much more than an inconvenience. A delay in traffic for some, a ruined wardrobe for others. This probably happens so often, it won't even end up in print. I know what she's trying to do here. I get it, because I'm not dumb. I was going to say something mean then, but I won't. I'll save that till later. But seeing someone's skull pop open under a tyre and brain splatter everywhere would probably make everyone look, even if it was just a glance. You liar. I lived... I've lived, I lived in London for years. Saw a dead body once. It's not something that you just ignore or walk past. You definitely go, oh, great. There's a dead body there. <sighs> I'm very annoyed by this only two pages in. I don't believe that the New Yorkers are so much more jaded than everyone else. So the narrator sees this tragic death scene and immediately turns it into World War Me. Here, I'm invisible, unimportant. Manhattan is too crowded to give a shit about me and I love her for it. Lady, someone's mangled corpse is right there in front of you. Stop thinking about yourself for five seconds, you Carrie Bradshaw. A man stops to find out if our protagonist is okay, but she's covered in the dead bloke's blood, so they go to a coffee shop toilet so she can clean up. The smell of blood was strong enough to remember it all these years later. <sighs> Spoiler alert, so our protagonist lives. Boring. The bloke is still with her inside the toilet as she washes, which, sure... He heads for the door, but instead of giving me privacy while I stand here in my least attractive bra, he locks us inside the bathroom so no one will walk in on me while I'm shirtless. It's disturbingly chivalrous and leaves me feeling uneasy. I'm tense as I watch him through the reflection in the mirror. Colleen, it is not appropriate for a man to lock a woman in a bathroom, no matter the intentions. She doesn't know this bloke. He could be an axe murderer or Andrew Tate or something. <sighs> Colleen Hoover, locking women in rooms is your kink, isn't it? Someone knocks. Be right out, he says. I relax a little, comforted by the thought that someone outside this door would hear me scream if I needed to. <sighs> See, this is not sexy, Coho. The bloke gives her his shirt, cryptically saying he's seen worse than another man's head pop like a balloon. His shirt. When he drops his arm, he regards my face for a moment before taking a step back. His eyes match the tie he just shoved in his pocket. Chartreuse. <sighs> sure. He's handsome, but there's something about him that makes me think he wishes he wasn't. Almost as if his looks might be an inconvenience to him. A part of him, D doesn't want anyone to notice. He just wants to be invisible in the city. Just like me. World War me. The protagonist's name is Lowen. The other guy is Jeremy. Lowen is curious about why Jeremy is too deep for you. And Jezza says that five months ago, he pulled his eight-year-old daughter's body out of a lake. I can't wait for Lowen to somehow liken this to her plight of trying to be invisible in New York. I swallow before I speak because my tragedies are nothing compared to his. I think of the most recent one, embarrassed to speak it out loud because it seems so in insignificant compared to his. My mother died last week. Why did I say it like that? My mother died last week. 
Um, he doesn't react to my tragedy like I reacted to his. He doesn't react at all. And I wonder if it's because he was hoping mine was worse. It isn't. He wins. Why is it a race to the bottom with you people? Today is the first time Lowen has gone outside in weeks. What shitty luck. Jeremy is wearing a wedding ring. The conversation ends, they leave the bathroom. Lowen is internally bemoaning that the hospice took all of her mother's morphine because she could really use some right now. Considering this is a coho protagonist, I doubt she's ever done anything harder than aspirin. She's just trying to be edgy. Chapter two. When Corey texted me last night to let me know about the meeting today, it was the first time I'd heard from him in months. I was sitting at my computer desk, staring down at an ant as it crawled across my big toe. The ant was alone, fluttering left and right, up and down, searching for food or friends. He seemed confused by his solitude. Or maybe he was excited for his newfound freedom. I couldn't help but wonder why he was alone. Ants usually travel with an army. See, I was joking before, but she actually is Carrie Bradshaw. With men's heads exploding left and right and dying a graphic death, I couldn't help but wonder, was my love life exploding and dying too? I know, my talents are wasted on YouTube. So Lowen used to have sex with Corey, but one of them is an author and the other their agent. He didn't ask about my mum in the text. I wasn't surprised. His lack of interest in anything other than his job and re himself are the reasons we're no longer together. His lack of concern made me feel unjustly irritated. He doesn't owe me anything, but he could have at least acted like he cared. Yeah, I feel like if you know this guy well enough that you used to bang for several years and you've known each other for several years, the least he could do is offer condolences. The, the least. The bar is in the earth's core for clean hoover men. Lowen keeps thinking about the ant. It's fascinating and very not like the other girls. Lowen's own mother didn't trust her as a child and kept her secluded because she had sleepwalking issues. Why do I sound like Matt Berry then? Sleepwalking issues. So Lowen didn't have many friends and now she's a loner. Lowen is waiting at a publishing house and Jeremy turns up. They have a meeting on the same floor. Lowen is the writer, surprise, surprise. And so is Jeremy's wife. Jeremy is having a meeting with Lowen. Wow, what are the chances? The actual meeting isn't until 9.30, but I figured you'd be late, so I told you nine. I paused, staring at the back of his head. What the hell, Corey? If he told me 9.30 rather than nine, I wouldn't have witnessed the accident across the street. I wouldn't have been subjected to a stranger's blood. Well, technically, if you didn't make the habit of always being so late that Corey had to lie to you to get you there on time, then you wouldn't have seen the bloke's head pop. So I guess it's still your fault. How's your mother? She died last week. He wasn't expecting that. He leans back in his chair and tilts his head. Why didn't you tell me? I don't care about either of these people enough to make an argument for or against. I just don't. Her mother died from colon cancer. I mask my disquiet with a smile, even if his concern is only a formality. I'm fine. It helps that it was expected. I'm only saying what I think he wants to hear. I'm not sure how he would react to the truth, that I'm relieved she's gone. My mother only ever brought guilt into my life. Nothing less, nothing more. Just consistent guilt. Drama alert. She promised... She promised what was left in her bank account after her death would help me catch up on all the time I've had to take off for my writing career. For the past year, I've lived off of what little advance I had from left over from my last publishing contract, but it's all gone now and apparently so is my mother's money. It was one of the last things she confessed to me before she finally succumbed to the cancer. I would have cared for her regardless of her financial situation. She was my mother. But the fact that she felt she needed to lie to me in order for me to take to agree to take her in proves how disconnected we were from one another. That is, um... Uh, that was a lot of baggage to drop on me, lady. Corey and Lowen were together for six months and shagging for two years after that. They must have had a magic penis. Corey was in love with the female protagonist of Lowen's first novel. Assumed the character would be like Lowen and then got into a relationship with her. BFFR, Coho. In what world would a bloke do that? Be so in love with a female character that he would think that the writer is... I mean, yes, it's probably happened, but BFFR. The meeting starts and Jeremy appears. I'm going to call him Jeremy. Jeremy and I shake hands and he does a good job of pretending we didn't share an extremely bizarre morning. He quietly takes the seat across from me. I try not to look at him, but it's the only place my eyes seem to want to travel. I have no idea why I'm more curious about him than I am about this meeting because you fancy him. Why are all coho women so dense with no self-awareness? The clients are essentially after a ghostwriter to complete three remaining books in a series of someone else's, Jeremy's wife. The writer is Verity Crawford, who isn't in the meeting, but shares Jeremy's last name, thus must be his wife. Book tours, press releases. Corey is looking at me now. He knows I'm not okay with that aspect. A lot of authors excel in reader interaction, but I'm so awkward. I'm afraid once my readers meet me in person, they'll swear off my books forever. I've only ever done one signing and I didn't sleep for the week leading up to it. I was so scared during the signing that it was hard for me to speak. Me. Why am I being such a brat? The next day, I received an email from the reader who said I was a stuck up bitch sir and she never read my books again. <laughs> Shut up and do the job that you're being paid for. Why is every character 
like in fiction, who has to do stuff like this, scared of it. I feel like I'm maybe being unrelatable here. Like maybe this is relatable for people, I don't know. But for me, because we read it so often, right? It's so frequent. It'd be nice if one character actually enjoyed things like meeting the fans and maybe not doing the press part because I'm sure no one enjoys that, but it's kind of what you have to do, you know, to promote your stuff, you just grin and bear it. I don't think I've ever read a writer character or some of a similar character be like, oh fab, I love meeting people and I love talking to people. So it's just a bit dull because we, we've heard it all before. It'd be nice if someone actually did like talking to people in these books. I just don't think you're quirky and special if you can't hold a conversation. If anyone takes offense to that right now, right? Even though I'm just having a go at fictional characters, if anyone takes offense to that, because maybe you can't hold a conversation, I'll give you some tips. People just love talking about themselves. So ask them open-ended questions about themselves. You don't even have to talk about yourself. That's a tip. Jeremy is willing to pay $75,000 per book whilst Verity will get all the royalties. My stomach leaps at the mention of that kind of payout, but as quickly as the excitement lifts my spirits, they sink again when I accept the enormity of it all. Going from a nobody writer to co-author of a literary sensation is too much of a jump for me. I can already feel my anxiety sinking in just thinking about it. I try to catch Corey's attention. I want to let him know that negotiations aren't necessary. There's no way I'm accepting an offer to finish a series of books that I'd feel too nervous to write. Why is she bothering to be a published author if she does doesn't want success, doesn't want money to pay her rent, doesn't want her books read by people. Why is writing your main job if you don't want any of those things from it? Just keep it as a hobby, like for yourself in that case, maybe like chuck it on Amazon, see if it sells, if it doesn't, like no drama either way. It's, this is not a side gig, this is her main gig. Like, I, what are you talking about? 225 grand she's being offered here. And you know, if she was smart enough and maybe moved out of New York City, she could live on that for quite a while. You could just like stay indoors and deliver her food for like years. Why don't these people want more for themselves? It's because we're meant to find this relatable. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't. Maybe it's a me problem then. If someone wanted to pay me 200 grand to ghost write some books, not demand, it's under my name for starters, I'd do it. But I'm sure it's just a way of Coho showing us that this girl has faux modesty or she's relatable because she's just so insecure, but it's inept. It's romanticized ineptness. That's what I'm coining it, right? Because I would happily write anyone's rubbish for $75,000, happily. I wouldn't think twice. Imagine all the, I wouldn't need to leave my flat. I would just get Deliveroo like every day for a year. After taxes and cuts and such though, it would go from two to 5K to 100K instead, which Lowen doesn't have anything else going on. So she still needs to take it. And we find out in a few chapters time that she's got eviction notices on her door because she's not been paying her rent. She needs this job. She can't pass it up because of some fake modesty. Lowen tries to decline the deal because she's an idiot. I don't know how I'm meant to respect her as a character, as a business, nothing. Well, she's not a businesswoman, but you know what I mean. Which creative types can also be savvy business people as well. It's not like one or the other. It's not like someone's just the struggling artist and all they like, they live and breathe for their art. And that's what they do, but they're, they, they're inept when it comes to everything. Like, be, shut up. <laughs> people can be more like multifaceted than that. So apparently when Colleen Hoover wrote this, I know this because Rachel told me and sent me some clips. She saw Verity, Coho that is, as the evil villain, which at the time I assumed is because Verity is actually going to be adequate at her job and we can't have women actually excelling at things now, can we? Jeremy asked to have a word with Lowen alone and he admits that Verity can't finish the series as she was in a car accident. Lowen's first book, Open Ended, is one of Verity's favorite books, hence why they reached out to Lowen in the first place. Jeremy watches me silently, probably wondering why I'm not reacting as most writers would do to this opportunity. He can't figure me out. Normally, I'd be proud of that. I don't like being easily read. I'm not like the other writers. Both of Jeremy's daughters died. He had twins. He randomly trauma dumps on her and naturally she loves it. It makes her feel special for him doing it. That lawyer is lowballing you. Tell your agent to ask for half a million. Tell them you'll do it with no press under a pen name with an ironclad non-disclosure. That way, whatever it is you're trying to hide can stay hidden. Yeah, sure, let's just jump through hoops for this random woman, okay. I look down at the table, confused by what just happened. Confused as to why I'm being offered such a substantial amount of money for a job I'm not even sure I can do. 
half a million dollars and I can do it under a pen name with no tour or publicity commitment? What on earth did I say that led to that? Even Loan can't suspend her disbelief. So how am I meant to? But she does seem to have like supernaturally low self-esteem. So I can already guess at this point that she's going to bang this dude, even though he's married to, I was guessing at the time, a comatose woman. Which, if so, how does someone with such really bad self-esteem get that much audacity? It's inconsistent. Chapter three. I had a boyfriend in my early 20s named Amos who liked being choked. Uh, I don't know where I asked, but thanks. I wonder where I'd be had I entertained his urge. Would we be married now? <laughs> Would we be married now? Would we have children? Would he have moved on to even more dangerous sexual perversions? I'm crying at Christian Coho thinking choking is like a dangerous perversion someone introduce her to mormon soaking please that's worse than a little bit of choking i think that's what worried me the most of him in your early 20s vanilla sex should satisfy a person without the need to introduce fetishes so early on in a relationship what coho would need to be baptized again if she heard about my sexual exploits in my 20s if she thinks a bit of choking is this bad Guys, I think I share too much with you. Lowen has been receiving eviction notices. Told you, I weren't lying. She and Corey celebrate the new contract with Champagne. And she didn't even tell Corey that she was getting eviction notices, by the way. He's only your agent. He probably needs to know if one of his writers is going to end up homeless. Lowen is going to go to Verity's house in Vermont to read through her office notes for the series. Corey finds this suspicious that Jeremy wants Lowen to stay at his house with her face and suspects that maybe Jeremy killed his daughters and injured his own wife. Except... One daughter had an allergic reaction, another drowned in a lake, and his wife hit a tree in her car, so probably unlikely. Though, maybe. Anyway, Corey goes home. Chapter four. It's a six-hour drive to the house, so instead of wasting time, Lowen listens to a Verity Crawford audio book. This is actually a good thing because it means she's preparing for her job, which she barely does for the rest of the book, by the way. But it's been framed as a bad thing because the book is so good that it hurts her self-esteem. I have no patience for this because everything is just World War Me, woe is me with this. So I just, I don't, she's not likable enough for me to be like, oh, I sympathize. You know, if a character is likable, then I will sympathize. But this woman is annoying. And by the way, she's not even read any of the series that Verity was writing before her car accident. So I just, what in what universe would these people give her the job when she's not even familiar with the, okay, Coho. I spend the rest of the drive ready to go back to New York, my tail between my legs, but I stick it out because thinking I'm not good enough is part of the writing process. It's part of mine anyway. For me, there are three steps to completing each of my books. Start the book and hate everything I write. Keep writing the book despite hating everything I write. Number three, finish the book and pretend I'm happy with it. Again, this isn't unique. I have had real life accomplished authors tell me it takes decades for the cringe to go away if it ever actually does. So you aren't special for hating your work, babe. Just get on with it. Do you think I like this? Actually, I do, because I'm well funny. There's more nonsense about, where well, I just don't want any kind of attention because I'm not like the other people. Well, do another job then. And I'm not, like, I'm clearly not saying that if you write, it should have to be for public consumption, rah, 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 rah. But there's a difference between, <laughs> rah, rah, rah. There's a difference between, you know, doing something as a hobby for yourself, right? And then monetizing it and making it your main gig. There's a difference. So I just, I don't want to hear her complaining. This is my life, sort of homeless, living out of a suitcase just one and a half weeks after the last of my immediate family members passes away. Can it get any worse? I could be married to Amos right now, so life could always be worse. Jesus, Lowen, I roll my eyes by inability to realize how many writers would kill for this kind of opportunity. And here I am thinking my life has hit rock bottom. Well, at least she's self-aware. Boy, I hope it will last. She arrives at the house. My mother used to say that houses have a soul. And if that is true, the soul of Verity Crawford's house is as dark as they come. So this woman is already set up to be a villain just because she has a gothy house. A little boy stares at Lowen. This is Jeremy's son. I look at the house behind him, wondering what that must be like for a child to grow up in such a home must be nice i mutter okay so both his sisters are dead and his mum is currently in a coma so leave the jealousy at the door you idiot i save my suitcase for later and shut my door following the little boy i'm only a few feet behind him when he opens the front door and walks into the house and then closes the door in my face i wait a moment wondering if maybe he has a sense of humor but i can see through the frosted window at the front door and he continues through the house and doesn't come back to let me in i don't want to call him an asshole he's a little kid and he's been through a lot but I think he might be an asshole. What the hell? He's five, you freak. How am I meant to support Lowen for dabbing on a five-year-old? A five-year-old 
who is like severely traumatized from all this stuff that's happened, like no less. Get a life. Jeremy comes to open the door. I don't like the buzz rushing through me right now. His wife is in a coma. Can you literally not, you home wrecking shrew? Jeremy gives Lo in the master bedroom as it's next to Verity's office, especially that I'll be sleeping in their bed. My eyes are pulled to the headboard, specifically to the teeth marks bitten into the top edge of the headboard in the center of the bed. I immediately tear my eyes away before Jeremy catches me looking. He'll probably see all over my face that I'm wondering which one of them had to bite the headboard in order to keep quiet during sex. Have I ever had sex that intense? Nope, if that's a wooden headboard, you can get to fuck. There is no way that you you wouldn't bash all of your teeth out if you did that. Verity has a nurse due to being so injured. They make up the pen name Laura Chase for Loan. Jeremy takes Loan to meet Verity. Verity lies in a bed staring and blinking, unaware of anything. She has a nurse called April. They go to her office. I look at the shelves containing the series I'm taking over. There are to be nine total books in the series, six have been published and three are still to be delivered. The series title is The Noble Virtues and each book is a different virtue. The three that are left up to me are courage, truth and honor. Sure sounds like a TikTok author. It's quite a funny thought though, when a writer writes a writer character because Coho, right, no offense, is a very mediocre writer. Like genuinely, actually quite bad, no offense. So her writing a character where in universe their work is good seems like a impossible challenge. <laughs> I was hoping that we would actually get some snippets or excerpts from the fictional book series that Lowen's writing so we could be really judgmental about it, but we don't, so. Jeremy closes the door and I settle in at Verity's desk. Her desk chair alone probably costs more than a month's rent in my apartment. I wonder how much easier writing is for someone who has money to burn on things I've always dreamt of having at my disposal while I write. <sighs> right, okay, so you've already had a whinge that you never wanted riches or fame, just enough money to pay rent to continue writing. But now you're complaining that like you, you don't have as much nice stuff as Verity does. So which is it? You want to be a struggling artist or more, you just want to romanticize the whole struggling artist thing or you wanna have cash to burn, like make up your mind. She listens to the first audio book on the six hour long car drive. And right now she starts reading the second book. So the first book audio wise is only six hours long. So I went onto my audible and Heaven in Disorder, a audio book by Slavoj Žižek is also only six hours long, which in book format is 240 pages. So based solely upon this, I'm guessing that Verity's books are also this short, right? 240 40 or 50 pages a piece. So Lowen has six months to write the first one and then up to two years later to write the last two for half a million dollars. So like what, 750 pages maybe in two years for half a million dollars? Easy mate, I could do that in like two couldn't because I don't write any of my stuff but if I was given half a million dollars I could I don't want to hear Lowen complain again basically she's not doing Lord of the Rings is she I end up reading for three hours straight I haven't moved from my spot not even once chapter after chapter of intrigue and fucked up characters really fucked up characters it's going to take me time to work myself into that mindset while writing no wonder Jeremy doesn't read her work all her books are from the villain's point of view so that's new to me I really should have read all the books before arriving. So I'm guessing it's from the villain's point of view because Verity is actually a villain for being a woman or something. And yes, you should have read these books before arriving. Yeah, congrats. Lowen finds an autobiography of Verity's. It's not at all what I'm searching for. An autobiography isn't what the publishers are paying me to turn in. So I should just move on. But I look over my shoulder to make sure the door is shut because I'm curious. Besides, reading some of this is research. I need to see how Verity's mind works to understand her as a writer. That's my excuse anyway. I carry the manuscript to the couch, make myself comfortable and begin reading. Lowen is the real villain of the story. So be it, chapter one. So this was exciting for me because Colleen Hoover was having to write as a in-universe really good writer. So of course it's going to be pretentious and terrible. Author's note, the thing I abhor about most autobiographies are the counterfeit thoughts draped over every sentence. Told ya, I never lie. A writer should never have the audacity to write about themselves unless they're willing to separate every layer of protection between the author's soul and their book. The words should come directly from the center of the gut, tearing through flesh and bone as they break free. Ugly and honest and bloody and a little bit terrifying, but completely exposed. An autobiography encouraging the reader to like the author is not a true autobiography. No one is likable from the inside out. One should only walk away from an autobiography with, at best, an uncomfortable distaste for its author. I will deliver. Told you. It's about Verity meeting Jared, which, okay. 
Right, so this is her manuscript. This is her autobiography, right? And the fact that her autobiography starts with her meeting her husband. So she just didn't have a life before that? Sure. Until that moment, the idea of love had always felt very manufactured to me. A hallmark ploy, a marketing scheme for greeting card companies. I had no interest in love. My only goal that night was to get drunk on free booze and find a rich investor to fuck. Ah, see, Verity is a villain because she likes booze and sex. He was talking with a few other men, but every time he'd glance in my direction, I felt like we were the only two people in the room. Every now and then, he would smile at me. Of course he did. I had on my red dress that night, the one I stole from Macy's. Don't judge me. I was a starving artist and it was ridiculously expensive. I intended to make up for the theft when I had the money. I'd donate to a charity or save a baby or something. The good thing about sins is that they don't have to be atoned for immediately. And that red dress was too perfect for me to pass up. Yeah, she sure sounds like a world-renowned writer. She sounds just like the annoying bloke, I forget his name, from November 9. That's what she sounds like. And it gets worse. Also, so she talks about a lot of horrible stuff in this manuscript, but there's a twist at the end. So you just really have to bear in mind, especially when it starts to get really edgy and dark. It was a fuckable dress. The kind of dress a man can easily bypass when he wants between your legs. The mistake women make when they choose their clothes for events like the one I was at is that they don't think about them from a man's perspective. Oh no, heavens to Betsy, a woman's not thinking about her clothes from a man's perspective. Oh, whatever we do, Colleen Hoover. A woman wants her breasts to look good, her figure to be hugged, even if that means sacrificing comfort and wearing something impossible to remove. But when men look at dresses, they aren't admiring the way it hugs the hips or the kinch at the waist or the fancy tie at the back. They're sizing up how easy it will be to remove will he be able to slip his hand up over her thigh when they're seated next to each other at a table will he be able to fuck her in a car without the awkward mess of zippers and spanks will he be able to fuck her in the bathroom without having to remove her clothes completely the answer to my stolen red dress were yes yes and hell yes this is like laughably bad world renowned writer my ass she sounds again i must reiterate she sounds exactly like the toxic male lead from november 9 watch that you see what i mean i can feel how edgy coho thinks she's being but she's just writing this character like how she writes her blokes <laughs> jeremy didn't look at me in that moment he simply kept his hand on my shoulder as if he was laying claim to me when the bartender approached i watched in fascination jeremy nudged his head towards me and said make sure you only serve her water for the rest of the evening excuse me I'm perfectly capable of deciding when I've had enough to drink. Jeremy smirked at me and even though I hated the arrogance behind that smirk, he was good looking. I'm sure you are. I've only had three drinks all evening. Good. I stood up straight and called the bartender back over. I'll have another Moscow mu Mos Moscow that drink please moscow mule moscow mule moscow why am i why am i slipping up on that the bartender glanced at me then jeremy then back at me i'm sorry ma'am i've been asked to serve you water i rolled my eyes i heard him ask you to serve me water i'm standing right here but i don't know this man and he doesn't know me i'd like i'd like another moscow mule She'll take a water, Jeremy said. Coho's kink is letting men control her. He laughed, moving his until his back was against the bar and stared at me with a tilted head and a crooked smile. I've been watching you since the moment I walked through the door. You've had three drinks in 45 minutes. And if you keep going at that rate, like what a loser for watching her and keeping note of her drinks. Get a life. If you keep going at that rate, I won't feel comfortable asking you to leave with me. I'd much rather you make that choice while you're sober. I mean, if they're strong drinks, she might be tipsy already. His voice sounded like his throat was coated in honey. Honey's quite thick, so wouldn't that be like, ah, like sponge, what was that? <laughs> like SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wouldn't it sound a bit like, I held eye contact with him, wondering if it was an act. Could a man that good looking and presumably rich also be considerate? It felt more presumptuous than anything, but I was drawn in by his gall. Verity gets water because she's a simp and that's that. I liked his teeth, perfect and white. I liked the stubble in his jaw. It was the perfect length to scratch my thighs. Maybe even scarred them if he stayed down there long enough. I'm guessing Verity is the villain of this because she isn't afraid of enjoying sex. And this says more about Colleen Hoover than it does Verity. They go to Jeremy's limo. Verity is 22, he is 27. But it's not actually Jeremy's limo. They just got in a random one because he lied about being rich, very quirky. I was surprised by how much I loved that he had brought me to a limo that wasn't even his. He wasn't rich, he wasn't rich, yet I still wanted to fuck him. Verity also so isn't rich she stole an invitation to the party from the trash can of the office that she was cleaning the limo driver comes back so they kiss and run away laughing what a rom-com movie i liked oh she like runs away barefoot as well of course she does very rom-com i liked that he believed he could like me it almost made me believe i was likable he takes her to some place called steak and shake and touches her up whilst they drink milkshakes very romantic he did 
His bed was in the middle of a studio apartment in Brooklyn. Jeremy wasn't rich. He could barely afford the steak and shake he had bought me, but I didn't care. I was on his bed, lying on my back, watching him undress, when I realised I was about to make love for the first time. I'd had sex before, but never with more than just my body. Make love. They just met. Stage five clinger. We ate Chinese takeout. We fucked. We ordered pizza. We fucked. We watched TV. We fucked. We both called in sick to work that Monday and by Tuesday I was obsessed. I was obsessed with his laugh, with his cock, with his mouth, with his skill, with his stories, with his hands, with his confidence, with his gentleness and with a new and intense need to please him. I needed to please him. I needed to be what made him smile, breathe, wake up in the mornings. And for a while I was. Wait until the twist in like two hours time, all right? He loved me more than he loved anything or anyone. I was his sole reason for living until he discovered the one thing that meant more to him than I did. So I was trying to already guess the stupid twist and I guessed, I bet the one thing he loves more is Lowen because Lowen's actually a time traveler or something. I don't know where I was going with that. Chapter five. Lowen leaves the office and hears a weird creaking. So immediately thinks that Jeremy is having sex with his comatose wife whilst a stranger is downstairs because, okay, sure. But Jeremy is actually next to her, so it's not true. The creaking sound is the hospital bed that lifts parts of Verity's mattress to help her pressure points and I guess stop bed sores. They go to the kitchen. I hate pizza. Oh, just not like the other girls. Mm. Whatever it means, I'm dying to read the next chapter now that I'm staring at him. And I hate that I have so many other things that should be my focus right now. But all I want to do is curl up and read about Jeremy and Verity's marriage. It makes me feel a little pathetic. Imagine paying someone half a million dollars, but they can't be asked and just want to pry into your marriage instead. How did she handle the fame? I think it was harder for me than it was for her. Because you like being invisible. Is it that obvious? I shrug. Fellow introvert here. He laughs. Verity isn't your typical author. She loves the spotlight, the fancy events. It all makes me uncomfortable. I like being here with the kids. Verity is the villain because she likes being sociable. I look at my plate and run my finger along the scalloped edge of it. His stare felt like it was going far past my eyes, into my thoughts. And even though he doesn't mean for it to, it feels very intimate. When Jeremy's eyes were on mine, it feels like an exploration of the deepest parts of me. Go away. Lowen goes away to read more of the manuscript instead of doing the work that she's being paid to do. So so be it. Part two. I was taken by him, addicted to him. I'm not sure it was healthy how codependent I was. Still am, really. But when a person finds someone who makes all the negativity in their lives disappear, it's hard not to feed off that person. I fed off Jeremy in order to keep my soul alive. It was starving and shriveled before I met him, but being in his presence nourished me. Sometimes I felt if I didn't have him, I couldn't function. Snore. They've been dating for almost two years at this point. However, two months before, Verity stopped paying her rent on her apartment and just moved in with Jeremy without him even realizing. So he asked her to move in and she's like, lol, already have mate, completed it mate. He had suggested I move in with him one night during sex. He does it sometimes. Makes huge decisions about our lives together whilst he's fucking me. I feel like that's irresponsible and stupid. And also like, who does that? Give up. Jeremy gets mad that she didn't tell him about her just moving in with him. So they continue to have sex and Verity rides his face and bites the headboard. Sure. I was happier than I'd ever been until he was transferred. Sure, it was only temporary, but you can't take away someone's only means of survival and expect them to function on their own. Am I reading New Moon again? I thought I finished that. Oh God, this is my groundhog day. Verity is bored about Jeremy, so she writes a book. As you do. I'm just jealous. What could I say? I'm just jealous. Maybe I should just boot my boyfriend out for a few months and then I'll write a book so I'll be so bored. I wrote an entire novel in the few months he was gone. When he showed up at our front door to surprise me with his return home, I had just finished the editing of the final page. It was kismet. I congratulated him with a blowjob. It was the first time I swallowed. That's how happy I was to see him. Ah yes, because good girls spit, but bad girls swallow. When I got to the bathroom, I locked the door, turned on the water in the sink and then puked in the toilet. When I let him come in my mouth, I had no idea how much there would be, how long I would have to continue sw- You're not drinking a glass. It's not, it's not like this glass of water, is it? Calm down, love. Keeping my composure was tough whilst his dick was in my throat, drowning me. <laughs> Amateur. Jeremy steals the manuscript to read to Verity's chagrin, but he likes it. I hope you're ready. For what? I asked. Fame. I laughed, but he didn't. He pulled off his pants and removed my panties. After he pushed into me, he said, do you think I'm kidding? He kissed me, then continued, your writing is gonna make you famous. Your mind is incredible. If I could fuck it, I would. Oh yes, I bet he was all there for her fame and money, but as soon as she got it, he's like, where? Things changed, where? Shut up. He asked her to marry him during sex. This is exactly like that one time in Will and Grace with Woody Harlson. What a romantic story to tell your friends. Oh, so how do you pop the question? 
well, he was he wasn't popping her cherry because that's already done. Popping her cervix, but at least he has a ring for her after sex. So it was a premeditated decision. They don't use a condom that night, so she gets pregnant. And here is where it gets real: the guts of my autobiography. This is the point where other authors would paint themselves in a better light rather than throw themselves into an X-ray machine. But there is no light where we're going. This is your final warning darkness ahead this is not how a good writer would write i despise the word i'm about to use but it's just so cheesy and corny Blech. chapter six the downside to verity's office is also the view from these windows the nurse has parked verity's wheelchair on the back porch right in front of the office i can see her entire profile as she faces west on the back porch it's a nice day out so the nurse is sitting in front of verity reading her book Verity is staring off into space and I wonder, does she comprehend anything? And if so, how much? Oh, well, I'm sorry that someone being unwell is ruining your view. Lowen has actually started working on the series. The clever and talented Verity is no longer in there. Trigger warning ableism? Was her body the only thing that survived that wreck? It's as if she were an egg cracked open and poured out and all that's left are the tiny fragments of hard shell. I glance back down at the desk and try to focus. I can't help but wonder how Jeremy is handsing, handling all of this. He's a concrete pillar on the outside but the inside has to be hollow. It's disappointing, knowing this is his life now. Caring for an eggshell with no yolk. That was harsh. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just, I don't know. I feel like it would have been better for everyone if she hadn't have survived the wreck. Sorry, I didn't know that you were a neuroscientist. Surely, she, we're meant to be on her side. She's the protagonist. We're meant to like her and, and agree with her to some extent, but surely she is the, the villain for thinking this stuff. Sometimes people don't just get better from comas or brain damage or accidents. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. The brain is very complex. So you can't just like discard people and throw them away just because it's not convenient anymore. Just because it's ruining your view. She's not a doctor. She's not a neuroscientist. What horrible little woman. I can't imagine this is how Verity would want him to live. I can't imagine this is how she would want to live. She can't even play with or speak to her own child. I pray she isn't in there for her own sake. I can't imagine how difficult it would be if her mind is still there, but the brain damage had left her with no physical way to express herself, robbing her of any ability to react or interact or verbalize what she's thinking. So whilst Lowen is silently trying to kill off Verity in her own mind, she notices that Verity is staring right at her. This one is meant to be a thriller, this book. It's what it's been sold as, except it sounds just like every other coho book that I've read so far. Woman simps over man, some other stuff happens, the end. Coho, I despise this and by extension you. At least I somewhat begrudgingly, in a way, if you squint you can see it, respect Stephanie Mayer. You are just a hack. Remember when she didn't like that Caleb YouTubers guy guys like reviews on her years ago and she weaponized her fan base against him like this i think he was a teenager at, at the time weaponized her fan base against a teenager because she didn't she would flip the lid if she ever saw any of my reviews but she can't bully me because i am <laughs> smarter than her <laughs> she can't bully me i wouldn't care i'll just close my laptop what are you gonna do <laughs> lowen freaks out and creeps away from the window lowen gets a phone call her apartment application has been rejected because of her prior eviction notice. While she's living at this mansion, she has tried to apply for an apartment in New York, been rejected because of the eviction. Da, 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 da. But don't worry, Jeremy was on the other side of the door eavesdropping. So he offers Lowen a loan and then offers to let her stay at the house until her write in advance hits her accounts, which sure is a lot of nice gestures he's done for someone he doesn't know. And we haven't had any real bonding scenes between the two. It's just them trauma dumping on each other. And that's basically it. She accepts his offer though. I was in the shower whilst writing this, you know, washing away the filth of the book. When I realized Verity detailed a graphic sex scene between her and Jeremy that I skimmed over because boring, but it was the bit where she mentions riding his face and biting the headboard in her autobiography. Who would write that in an autobiography? Lowen is outside watching Jeremy and Crew. Oh, Crew is the name of the little boy, by the way. Tear up the wood from their fishing dock. Jeremy is shirtless, so Lowen keeps gawking at a married man. April, the nurse, sees Lowen staring at a married man. Crew waves at Verity's bedroom window, but no one is there. This is the thriller aspect, by the way. And also, forgive me, but at this point, we're a third of the way into this book, and it's marketed as a thriller. Nothing thrilling has happened. I'd argue that nothing thrilling does happen until the extra chapter that she added on after this was published. I'm seeing things, but why was he waving at the window? 
If she wasn't there, why was he waving? It doesn't make sense. If she was looking at her window, Crew would have had a much bigger reaction, considering she hasn't been able to speak or walk on her own since her wreck. Or maybe he doesn't understand that his mother walking to her window would be a miracle. He's only five. Yeah, I think a five-year-old would realise that their previously incapacitated mother suddenly walking around is a big deal. And here, I was trying to guess the twist again. Is this the twist that Verity was actually fine all along, but wanted to wait around, see if Jeremy would cheat on her? It's worse than that. Also, the way that Lowen keeps noticing these creepy goings on and uh, crew is acting weird and whatnot and Jeremy hasn't noticed any of it. Hmm. Lowen goes to spy on Verity and finds her asleep in bed, but with her TV off, despite April saying she left the TV on. Regardless of the fact that I'm aware this is all in my head, I still walk back to Verity's office, close the door and pick up our and pick up another chapter of her autobiography. Maybe reading more from her point of view will reassure me that she's harmless and I need to chill the fuck out. Lowen then uses this as an excuse to snoop some more. Snooping, fancying a married man. Are you sure that she is a protagonist? Oh, and you know, hating the disabled. Are you sure she's a protagonist? Hoover. Honestly, all of these books make me want to write my own like toxic, stupid romance just to see if it would get published, you know? Because if she's doing it, why can't I do it? But it's a bit more tongue in cheek, so I don't really mean it. No, that would be worse actually, because I'd be aware that I'm putting out toxic men. That'd be worse actually. But it's annoying though, because if she's doing it, but she's oblivious. Anyway, so be it part three. Verity can tell that she's pregnant because she works out daily, sometimes twice a day, unlike her fat mother. Okay. Verity then starts working out three times a day because she's starting to show. I'm sure Verity is a villain because she clearly has body image issues. She and Jeremy have sex. Verity isn't eating enough because body image issues, obviously. I wanted to roll my eyes because technically it was nothing. Not a boy, not a girl. It was a blob. I wasn't that far along yet. So assuming the thing growing inside me was actually hungry or craving any particular type of food was absurd. But it was hard for me to state my case because Jeremy was so ecstatic about the baby. I didn't really care if he treated it like it was more than it was. This is why Verity is a villain because she understands science. Verity is pregnant with twins. I tried to force my smile when he talked about them. I would act like it filled me with joy when he rubbed my stomach, but it repulsed me, knowing he was only doing it because they were in there. Even if I delivered early, it didn't matter. Now that there were two of them, my body would suffer even more damage. I shuddered daily at the thought of them gro both growing inside me, stretching my skin, ruining my breasts, my stomach, and God forbid, the temple between my legs where Jeremy worshipped nightly. How could Jeremy still want me out of this? This is why she is the villain, because she's not glowing about the miracle of life crap. Some people don't take to parenthood well, which is realistic. Sounded like she didn't want to have kids at all, which would be fine if she didn't get pregnant. You have to just bear with until we get to the twist ending so then we can assess this all properly, okay? And content warnings from here on in, she says some pretty graphic and nasty stuff about her babies that some of you with kids might find upsetting. Some of you without kids might find it upsetting too because it's not nice imagery. So content warning from now on. Content warning as well, talks of miscarriages, abortions. During the fourth month of my pregnancy, I started hoping for a miscarriage. I prayed for blood when I went to the bathroom. I imagined how after losing the twins, Jeremy would make me his priority again. He would dote on me, worship me, care for me, worry for me, and not because of what was growing inside me. I took sleeping pills when he wasn't looking. I drank wine when he wasn't around. I did anything I could to destroy the things that were going to push him away from me, but nothing worked. They kept growing. My stomach continued to stretch. Yeah, it sounds like your character needs help, Colleen Hoover, not babies. Like, she's obviously very mentally unwell to be doing this, trying to harm herself, to harm the babies. But you know that in Coho's universe, it's, it's awful stuff that she's doing, but you know when Coho was writing this, she was thinking, oh yes, she's, she's evil because she's mentally unwell. Because what was the other one that I did? Layla, where the antagonist had a bunch of mental health issues and was vilified for that. And you understand, if you watch, you, you get it, whatever. So anyway, this is what makes her a villain, being very mentally unwell and not receiving any help or getting any help for it. I reached down and teased the strands of his hair with my fingers. Do you love them? He smiled because he thought I wanted him to say yes. I love them more than anything. More than me? He stopped smiling, kept his hand on my stomach, but he scooted up, sliding an arm under my neck. Different from you, he said, kissing my cheek. Different, yes, but more. Is your love for them more intense than your love for me? His eyes scanned mine and I was hoping he would laugh and say absolutely not, but he didn't laugh. He looked at me with nothing but honesty and said yes. Really? His reply crushed me, suffocated me, killed me. But that's how it should be, he said. Why? Do you feel guilty because you love them more than me? 
I didn't answer. Did he really think I loved them more than I loved him? I didn't even know them. So this is kind of relatable, not gonna lie. Unlike Colleen Hoover, I recognize that everyone is different and feels things differently. Because I'm more on the side of, I don't really understand how you can love someone who isn't born yet. Like, you don't really know them, their personality, <laughs> anything. <laughs> if it's love just for love's sake, then to me that feels almost a little bit superficial. Because you're just loving the people who don't exist yet because your biology is telling you to. Coho and many like other people and women would think that I'm a big villain for thinking that, but that's just the way that, but I wouldn't then like go and be nasty. Do you know what I mean? That's just, that's just personally how I feel about things. But I guess I just, I don't believe in love at first sight either. I, I don't believe in romantic, like fairy tale kind of nonsense. I feel that when it comes to this stuff and bonds and whatnot, I'm almost in like pragmatic to a fault. It's what, well, no, like that's just my, DNA and makeup, that's how I work. But I understand that people do feel that way and I'm not gonna be like, well, you shouldn't because you don't even know them yet because I'm not, I'm not insane. I'm not some sort of fascist, right? I'm not gonna tell you what to do, do what you want. Don't tell me what to do and how to feel, right? So unfortunately, I do relate more to evil Verity in this little moment. Not with the stuff that she's about to do though, by the way. But the thing is, is I also feel like I know Colleen Hoover's angle with some of these topics. I think that she thinks if you don't immediately take to motherhood at the moment of conception of the sperm meeting the egg, then you're not a good enough person. Some people don't take to parenthood until the baby is born. Some people don't even feel that maternal or paternal bond until like a few months into it. I've spoken to a variety of people on this subject, all right? And as long as you're not like doing nasty things or doing like abusive things or whatever, as long as you're providing, then I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but the bond's most likely gonna come along. That's how we survive as a species, you know, protect the young. I just really feel like Colleen's angle isn't, if you're not worshiping every single little fucking sperm in your, let's be real, husband's balls, then you're just a bad person, where? Enough my high horse. Basically, do what you want, I don't care. Don't make me do anything that I don't want to do though. Verity's own mother doesn't care about her and clearly this drives Verity's insecurities that Jeremy, am I saying Jeremy or what? That Jeremy will stop loving Verity. I'm not sure if this is really picked up on again that much though. Don't feel guilty, he said. I want you to love them more than you love me. Our love for each other is conditional. Our love for them isn't. My love for you is unconditional, I said. He smiled. No, it isn't. I could do things you would never forgive me for, but you'll always forgive your children. What, even if your kids become serial killers? <laughs> this is why I don't like the biological drive arguments for anything. Like my personal biology just wants me to eat sugar all of the time and I can't let myself because then my teeth will fall out. Jeremy is clearly a boy mum without even having boys or being a mum. He's a boy mum. He would forgive his child even if they were Ted Bundy. He's that type of person. Verity then tries to force a miscarriage with a wire hanger until the blood runs down her legs. What in the Stephen King coho? She's doing this because Jeremy has never cried for her but was crying with happiness over the pregnancy and she wants him to cry for her instead. Okay, mate. Chapter seven. Lowen then cries over this. Everyone's just boohooing. You can tell that she never read British Women's Weekly's magazines growing up. Messed up real life stories were a dime a dozen in those. I'm so desensitized and unempathetic because of Take a Break, That's Life and Chat Magazine. They messed me up. Grow some gonads, Lowen. Lowen starts implying that maybe Verity actually killed the daughters from jealousy slash spite. After a while of processing it, I put the manuscript in a drawer beneath a slew of other things. I don't ever want Jeremy to come across that, but before I leave here, I will destroy it. I can't imagine how he would feel if he read that. He's already grieving the deaths of his daughters. Imagine if he knew what they endured at the hands of their own mother. Respectfully, this is none of her business. You've known this bloke for all of five minutes and it's also not your thing to destroy. It's nothing to do with you. I might as well mention it here. Jeremy is well aware of the manuscript. He knows about it. So, Lowen looks for alcohol because she's so shaken by this, but she bumps into Jeremy. He has no idea what she was truly like. You don't know these people. You don't know about their marriage or what they did or didn't know, but ow. Lowen now doubts Verity's condition and her honesty and pokes around asking questions, clearly convinced that she's actually walking around whilst no one's looking. Is this the twist? Verity did all of this so Jeremy would only care about her. Did she have to bribe the doctors into keeping up the ruse too? We'll find out. There was no damage to Verity's spinal cord, just her brain apparently. 
apparently. Lowen remembers that Crew, the boy, exists. So Verity must have bonded with the girls post-pregnancy or else why would she have another child? Jeremy stands up in this crew of him effortlessly. That means it's bedtime. He throws Crew over his shoulder. Tell Laura goodnight. Crew waves at me and Jeremy rounds the corner and disappears with him upstairs. I take note of how he calls me by the pen name I'll be using in front of everyone else, but he calls me Lone when it's just us. I also take note of how much I like it. I don't want to like it. The bar is non-existent for Colleen Hooperman. I'm not sure if it was the alcohol, the food, or the realization that Verity probably wrote that horrific chapter because a much better one follows up. One where she realizes what a blessing those girls were to her. You don't know that, Lowen. Those girls could have been killing cats for all she knows. I'm only saying something this daft to highlight that Lowen does not know this family and should butt out. Lowen looks at pictures of the twins. One of them has a scar on her cheek from when she, what, that she was born with. Lowen thinks it's the failed abortion attempt. He doesn't elaborate, but I can feel him staring at me. I turn my head and our eyes meet. He holds my gaze for a moment, but then his eyes drop to my hand. He lifts it with delicate fingers, flipping it over. How'd you get this one? He asks, running his thumb over the scar on my palm. You're married, stop it. It's not that he makes me uncomfortable. Jeremy Crawford is a good man, okay? Maybe it's the manuscript that makes me feel uncomfortable because I have no doubt that he would have shared his love equally of his three children and his wife. He doesn't hold back even now. Even when his wife is virtually catatonic, he still loves her selflessly. Yeah, yeah, coho, selfless man, evil villain, woman, whatever. And may I add, he still loves her selflessly, even when she's virtually catatonic. It's not consistent with the twist. Doesn't make sense. We'll get there. Don't you worry, I've got all night. Jeremy puts a lock on Lowen's door at her request because she sleepwalks and one time she woke up with a broken wrist and covered in blood. Chapter eight. So whilst doing this, I was simultaneously reading A Clockwork Orange and it's insane that you have literature like that and then whatever the hell this is. And I don't care if people find that snobby, get good scrubs. The difference you feel when you read this and then something more advanced, mm. But just try it out. Maybe not a clockwork orange if you're a bit, I don't know. If you, I, I don't know. Maybe don't jump in straight away with that. Maybe try a little bit. What can I recommend? I really like The Idiot by Dov Trieski. It's quite chunky, but it's very dramatic. Kazuo Ishiguro, Never Let Me Go. Or oh, that will upset you. I have a heart of stone and I cried for days after that. Lowen hasn't touched the manuscript in two whole days. There's a different nurse today. Her name is Myrna. She's a little older than April, round and cheerful, with two rosy spots on her cheeks that make her look like an old fashioned coopy doll. Right off the bat, she's a lot more pleasant than April. And honestly, it's not that April is unpleasant, but I get the vibe she doesn't trust me around Jeremy or Jeremy around me. I'm not sure why she dislikes my presence, but I can see how protective of her patient would mean judging another woman who is staying in her invalid patient's home. I'm sure she thinks Jeremy and I lock ourselves in the master bedroom together after she leaves every evening. I wish she were right. I'm not sure why she dislikes me where. Boy, I wish I was fucking this married guy. Jeremy wants to go to the shops and ask Lowen if she wants anything, but she can't possibly tell this bloke, this married man with kids, plural at the time, well, plural previously, that she needs tampons. Heavens no. How will his fragile little masculine ears take it? So she elects to go with him instead. It has been briefly publicly announced that Lowen, under her pen name, will co-write the rest of Verity's series. Verity is ecstatic. Ha! At least I know never to trust another publicity announcement. I start reading the comments below the announcement. Who the heck is Laura Chase? Why is Verity handing over her baby to someone else? Nope, 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 nope. That's how it usually works, right? Mediocre author gets successful, hires shittier authors do her job. Why is that last comment me? Jeremy laughs. Never read the comments. Verity taught me that years ago. Finally, someone's speaking sense around here. Verity has more sense than a lot of them. Anyway, Jeremy helps Lowen out of the Jeep by taking her hand. So she starts thinking about his sex life. Keep it in your pants, babe. I have no idea why I'm embarrassed to buy tampons. It's not like he's never seen them. And knowing Jeremy, He's probably purchased them for Verity a few times. He seems like the type of husband who wouldn't think twice about it. How old is Lowen actually? Like 15 or what? If a man really has like some kids and he's still getting funny about buying you tampons, dump him. Jeremy gets ambushed by two attractive women, friends of Verity. The blonde looks like she's been handed a warm cup of gossip tea. Why did my brain want to read that as a warm cup of piss? <laughs> like what? We're friends of Verity's, Patricia says. She gives me a very noticeable, condescending look. This lady is my spirit animal. I'll share the message, Jeremy says, walking past her. Give my best to Sherman, Patricia makes a face. My husband's name is William. Jeremy nods once. Oh, that's right. I get them confused. I hear Patricia scoff as we walk away. When we make it to the next aisle, I say, um, who is Sherman? The guy she fucks behind her husband's back. I mean, I thought this was funny at the time, but it's also very hypocritical considering that 
he does the same thing okay whatever holy shit i say laughing when we get to the register i can't stop smiling i don't know if i've ever seen that kind of epic burn in person the moment is totally ruined by lowen being like let epic burn my dude like she's from 2010s memes like those rage react things yes but without hypocrites there would be no epic karmic moments like the one i just witnessed i think this is just a me thing but i don't like the word i, I don't like a lot of things to be fair Okay, just assume, unless, unless I tell you otherwise, just assume that I don't like anything. Don't like drinking water, don't like... No, I like all of this stuff, this is fine. Oh, except for, except for the eggs, I don't eat them. Why are there 24 of them? I don't eat them, so why are there, why is there a pack of 20... Mental. Why is that there? <laughs> I'm gonna be having a word with my partner. He's not eating all of them, surely. Who does he think he is? Henry VIII? Why is there 24? You can't see, there's two packs of 12 there. Anyway. So I, I dislike the word epic when it's used in kind of its modern context because it's always used to describe things that are just a bit like above average. It's very epic meal time. Oh, like here's a hundred baking strips, bacon strips, let epic. It's not really though, is it? I think this is just a me problem, so ignore me, please. Or don't, you're here on my channel for a reason. Jeremy grabs the rest of the things from the cart. I try to keep mine separate, but he refuses to let me pay, it, pay for it myself. I can't stop staring at him as he runs his credit card. I feel something. I'm not sure what. A crush? That would make complete sense. I would develop a crush on a man who is so devoted to his ailing wife that he's too blind to see anyone or anything else. He's too blind to even see who his own wife was. Man uses money, so now she's in love with him. Let epic burn. Oh God, maybe the toxic male podcasters were right. That is a joke. I do not mean that. Chapter nine. Lowen has only been here for five days and she hasn't finished that manuscript because she's really just like longing it out, which is unrealistic. You would read that in like a day, wouldn't you? Remember, Verity has two nurses. If she's pretending to be sick, she either has them in the ruse and she's paying them off or she just has to deal with two people constantly moving her and touching her. And she has to be that good at pretending to be, I guess, catatonic. Is that the right word? I'm not sure, sorry. Regardless, she has to be that good that she's fooling professionals. Yes, it is bullshit, we'll get there. Also, I thought Lohan was gonna show Jeremy the manuscript so he goes, oh my God, what a psycho. I can't believe I was married to her and falls in love with her and said, I was wrong. See, it can happen, sometimes I am wrong. He doesn't return the smile, but he doesn't look away. We hold eye contact for several seconds. I can feel his stare stirring up things inside me. It makes me wonder if it does anything to him when I look at him. She's really just out here fantasizing about a married man with a brain damaged wife. Coho, this does not make your protagonist likable. I know it'll be justified anyway, as well verity is a psycho and evil cheating's fine who cares because it seems to be what her beliefs i know she sure does justify very questionable behavior cheating all that type i'd be worried if i was Koho's husband anyway crew cries so lohan runs off to find him he was playing with verity's knife and cut his finger and he implies that verity has spoken to him but whether recently who knows the knife was there but then it disappears OMG, is it Verity moving things around? And I said at this moment, if the big reveal is that Verity is fine and just pretending, it's hardly going to be a satisfying aha moment when it's being jammed down our throats this much. Lowen catches Verity staring at her again, so she wants to run away. However, imagine that Verity actually isn't conscious of anything, right? Of any of this. And Lowen is just getting paranoid over nothing. Imagine. Crew brushes past me and returns to Verity's bedroom. I find it odd that sitting on her bed while he plays on his iPad is fun for him. But then again, I'm sure he just wants to be near his mother. Have at it, buddy. I don't want to be near her at all. Like, imagine the big reveal was that Verity really is brain damaged beyond healing, beyond repair. And this book is just low and dabbing on a disabled person the entire time. That's how unlikable your main character is, Colleen Hoover. I'm not sure how much longer I can try to convince myself that I don't have a serious crush on that man. I'm also not sure how much longer I can try to convince myself that Verity is a better person than she really is. I think after reading every book in her series and beginning to understand the reason her suspense novels do so well is because of how she writes them from the villain's point of view. Critics love that about her. When I listened to her first audiobook on the drive over, I loved that her narrator seemed a little psychotic. I wondered how Verity got in the mind of her antagonist like she did. That was before I knew her. I wonder if... Coho believes that this is the case. That to write psychotic characters, you ha you also just must, because how could you emphasize? How could you really put yourself in someone's shoes? How could you use your imagination if not? Like, yeah, Anthony Burgess was really bad, as, as bad as Alex in A Clockwork Orange, or Nabokov really was a nonce to write Lolita. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? I wonder if this is what Coho really thinks. Interesting. Well, what does that say about all of 
Colleen Hoover's protagonist then about her. I still don't technically know her, but I know the Verity who wrote the autobiography. It's apparent that the way she wrote the rest of her novels wasn't a u- unique approach for her. After all, they say write what you know. I'm beginning to think Verity writes from a villainous point of view because she's a villain. Being evil is all she knows. So Verity is, if this is the case, right, then... Rarity is mentally ill and she's being demonized for it instead of helped. Loan reads more of the manuscript. So be it. Part four. The babies are born despite Rarity trying her best to kill them in utero. The doctor left and the nurse was gone. It was just Jeremy, the girls and me. And I'm saying that she's mentally ill because like, well, the Rarity that we're getting from the manuscript's perspective, like is so obsessed with Jeremy that it's codependent to a ridiculous degree. It's very unhealthy. She's just like always trying to use sex as a way to solve their problem. She's always trying to have sex with him, not that he's complaining. She's all he thinks about. She can't like love anyone else. Like it's obsessive to a ridiculous degree. I mean, to the point that she didn't want to have her own babies because he would love them and she doesn't want anyone else to have his like that's to me i'm not a doctor but i think that's mental illness the verity that i'm reading on the manuscript is mentally ill in my viewpoint but this just makes her a villain she's just demonized for it instead the doctors left and the nurse was gone it was just jeremy the girls and me one of them was asleep in the glass bed thing i don't know what it's called funny how verity's sophisticated writing voice and style has just vanished as well he carried her to me and placed her in my arms i looked down at her i waited for the flood of emotions but there wasn't even a trickle again sometimes this doesn't happen i've spoken to a few women in my life who didn't feel that instant bond or the maternal rush but they still ended up bonded later on they still ended up to be good parents so Colleen Hoover what is your point plus you know sometimes the bond might not happen instantaneously okay but also postnatal depression and postnatal psychosis exists so are people who suffer these conditions villains in Colleen Hoover's eyes they are named Chastin and Harper. I was so sold on the thought of them not actually surviving their birth with all I had put them through. What I would do beyond that wasn't given much thought. I knew breastfeeding them would be the best choice, but I had absolutely no desire to do that kind of damage to my breasts, especially since there were two of them. Sounds like someone is hungry and nurse said as she pranced into the room. Are you breastfeeding? No, I said immediately. I wanted her to prance right back out of there. Jeremy looked at me concerned. Are you sure? There are two of them, I replied. I didn't like the look on Jeremy's face, like he was disappointed in me. I hated to think that this was was how it was going to be. Him taking their side, me not mattering anymore. Like to think that she doesn't matter anymore because she's had two kids. It's not well. But also maybe Jeremy should have two babies latch onto his nipples and see how he likes it. Breastfeeding sounds hellish, so I'm on Verity's side not wanting to do it. So there, Colleen Hoover. It felt wrong. This infant... (sighs) I don't want to read this. Sucking on something Jeremy had sucked on before. I didn't like it. How would he find my breasts attractive after seeing the babies feed from every single day? Like she's so hypersexualized and she only sees herself through this lens of would Jeremy find me attractive? I have to be attractive for him. Da, 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 da. Manuscript Verity is not well. All of her validation is based upon Jeremy's male gaze. Is he still attracted to me? Will he like my body? Women can be more than the objects of some bloke's attention, Khalid Hoover. I watched this chest and continue to feed from me. My stomach clenched as I tried my hardest not to show him how repulsed I was. I'm sure some mothers found this beautiful. I found it disturbing. I don't care if people breastfeed in public, whatever, it doesn't matter to me because bodies are bodies, boobs are bit it doesn't matter because I'm an adult, I don't care. But I wouldn't call the act of breastfeeding like, oh, this beautiful thing because I won't call children eating food beautiful either. It's just them getting sustenance in it. Big whoop. I do the same every time I eat chocolate and no one's calling me beautiful with chocolate all around my mouth. More reasons as to why I'm better than a baby because I can eat chocolate and they can't yet. I don't know what I'm talking about. She gives up on breastfeeding. Good for you. I wanted to remind him that he's always been protective of me, but it didn't feel like the right moment. I almost felt as if I were intruding on something I wasn't a part of. This father-daughter bond I was never going to be included in. He already loved them more than he had ever loved me. He was eventually going to take their side, even if I wasn't in the wrong. This was going to be so much worse than I had imagined it would be. Oh dear. His sudden tension disappeared in my quick recovery. He looked back down at Chastin and said, I've never loved anything this much. Do you think you were capable of loving someone so much? I rolled my eyes and thought to myself, I have loved someone this much, Jeremy. You, for four years. Thanks for noticing. Oh dear, oh dear. Also, why would she write any of this down where Jeremy could read it? And she found the manuscript, right? So not only did this did Verity write it on a computer, she also printed it, right? Where Jeremy could read it. A publisher wouldn't actually publish this as a real autobiography because it would be career suicide. To admit this type of stuff, game over. 
for your career. Chapter 10. I don't know why I'm surprised when I set the manuscript back in the drawer. The contents of the drawer rattle as I slam it shut angrily. Why am I angry? This isn't my life or my family. Exactly, it's none of your business. Do you know how fast I would exit from a mess like this? There'd be a dust cloud in my shape, like in the driveway. There'd be an Elise shaped hole through the door. She seems so cold and hard, but I'm not a mother. Do a lot of mothers feel this way about their children at first? If so, they certainly aren't honest about it. It's probably similar to when a mother claims she doesn't have a favourite child, but they probably do. It's an unspoken thing between mothers. One I suppose you don't become aware of until you are one. I'm gonna die on a hill right now. Millions of parents totally do have a favourite child and I don't know why people protest this so hard. I mean, in some cultures, it's more favourable to have boys. From that angle, it makes sense that in some cultures, the boy would be the favorite child. What I'm saying is gonna be met with some pearl clutching, but it's true. I've seen people have favorite children before. Anyway, we find out that Lowen is 32. She doesn't sound like it. Or maybe Verity just didn't deserve to be a mother. Sounds like she didn't want to be a mother until Colleen Hoover forced it upon her. And also she is clearly unwell and needs help. But if I ever do find myself in a relationship with a man I'd want to father my child, it would be someone like Jeremy. Rather than appreciate the wonderful father he seemed to be, Verity resented him. Babe, you've known him for like two weeks, good lord. This is why she doesn't sound 32 to me. She sounds like a teenager with a crush. Oh, I wish this man's wife would hurry up and die so we could make babies together. I found boxes of pictures in Verity's office closet this week as I was rummaging through her things. I pulled a box down but haven't gone through the pictures yet. It seems like another invasion of privacy on my part. This family, at least Jeremy has entrusted me to finish this series and I keep getting sidetracked by my obsession with Verity. Again, imagine paying someone half a million to do a job, but they waste time snooping on your wife. But if Verity is putting so much of herself into her series, I really do need to get to know her as well as possible. This isn't really snooping, it's research. There you go, justification complete. Very mature 32 year old. Jeremy finds Lowen looking through pictures of his daughters. Harper had autism. I wrote here, I don't know if it's gonna be a relevant detail. I still don't know if it's a, and Colleen Hoover says Asperger's, but I did some reading online. Apparently that's an outdated term. So this one is of Verity and the girls. He handed it to me. The three of them are dressed alike in matching pajamas. If Verity didn't love the girls in this photo, she was certainly good at faking it. I once, <laughs> tangent time, read a post on r slash true off my chest about a diagnosed sociopath. I'm pretty sure they were a sociopath. I could be wrong though. Who revealed that they don't actually love their children, but their children are none the wiser and they've been set up with the best educations. They want for nothing. This person listens to them. They feel loved. The person kind of sees them as pets in their heads, but the kids are totally ignorant of this. And I thought it's interesting because you're never truly going to actually know what goes on in another person's head. Anyway, you can't unless you were psychic. And if the kids are truly none the wiser of the reality, does it matter? What is more important, the intent or the outcome? He doesn't break eye contact, doesn't skip a beat. My world was turned upside down when Chastin died. And then when Harper died, it ended completely. He looks back down at the box of pictures. When I got the call about Verity, the only thing left in me to feel was anger. Toward who? God? No, Jeremy says, his voice quiet. I was angry at Verity. He looks back at me and he doesn't even have to say why he was angry at her. He thinks she hit the tree on purpose. Lowen gives Jeremy a long, too long to be appropriate hug, probably enjoying that this man's grief is enabling her to get physically closer to him because Colleen Hoover sure is odd like that. I feel all of his hesitation as his hand moves slowly up towards the back of my head. My eyes are closed, but I open them because I want to look at him. There's a pull in me, tilting my head back into his hand as I lift my face from his chest. He's looking down at me now, and I have no idea if he's about to kiss me or pull away, but either way, it's too late. I feel everything he's been trying not to say in the way he holds me, in the way he stopped inhaling. I can feel him bringing me closer to his mouth, but then his eyes flicker up and his hand falls. Bro, you're married. Sometimes tragedies like this do happen in real life and people can't deal with the loneliness and they end up divorcing their incapacitate a partner, which I think is just an impossible situation really, because you can't, I, I don't think that you can expect someone to be in a completely 100% one-sided relationship if someone is essentially unconscious, right? It's heartbreaking and in that situation, it's no one's fault, this stuff happens and someone can either choose to stay with them or choose to not, it's an impossible situation, it's horrible to think of. But I think, you know, if you realize that you can't do it, you can't deal with the loneliness anymore, then leaving and, getting a divorce, I don't, I'm not sure how you get a divorce. I'm sure you can, but I'm not sure how. I think leaving is preferable to pretending that you're gonna uphold your vows of in sickness and in health, and then just cheat on your unconscious partner instead. Do you see my point? Crew interrupts them and cries over the pictures. 
I need to lie down. Maybe I shouldn't have taken two Xanax tonight. Or maybe I shouldn't have brought family pictures out and put them on display in front of a family who still hasn't recovered from their loss. Or maybe I shouldn't have almost kissed a married man. Yeah, maybe not, you genius. Chapter 11. Lohan keeps hearing footsteps at night. Boy, if it is Verity, she sure isn't doing a good job of subterfuge. April is feeding Verity. Lohan notes that Jeremy never actually speaks to Verity. Well, how does he like dote on her lovingly then? Like what she was saying, I don't know, a few chapters ago. After eating a few bites of the pudding, I decide to try making small talk with this woman who refuses to interact with me. Why though? Why are you so annoying? April has only been looking after Verity for four weeks. What is the timeline of this book? When did the accident happen? Because if it was pretty recently, then Jeremy sure gave up on his wife quickly. No, April wipes Verity's mouth and then places the tray of food on the table. Can I speak for you for a moment? She nudges her head toward the hallway. I pause, wondering why we need to leave the kitchen in order for her to have a conversation with me. I stand up though and follow her out. I lean against the wall and spoon another bite of pudding into my mouth as April shoves her hands into her pockets of her scrub top. Is it just me or is Lowen really rude? Why does she act like a teenager? Just like with a spoon hanging out of her mouth, just like lazing against the wall as someone's about to talk to her. She's really rude. I think my British sensibilities just came out then. Just so uncouth, mm, vulgar. I don't expect you to know this, especially if you've never been around someone in Verity's condition, but it's not respectful to discuss people like her as though they aren't right in front of you. I'm gripping my spoon about to pull it out of my mouth. I pause for a moment. I hate this imagery so much. Like I can see it in my head and I, fucking hate her it's really why is this really winding me up like stand up take the spoon out of your gob you idiot <laughs> i pause for a moment then shove the spoon back into the pudding cup i'm sorry i wasn't aware that's what i was doing it's easy to do especially if you believe the person can't acknowledge you verity's brain doesn't process like it used to obviously but we don't know how much she does process just watch how you word things in her presence i stand up straight pulling away from my casual position against the wall i had no idea i was being insulting so i guess at least here coho is being intentional with Lowen being rude. It's still like an odd choice to make considering that she's our protagonist. Ideally, we should like her, be rooting for her. It's, it's, what's the point? Crew finds a turtle. So Lowen goes outside with him to play with the turtle. I sit down next to him, partly because I'm starting to feel really bad for this kid, but also because we have a clear view of Jeremy from this spot in the yard as he works on the dock. You are a rotten, obsessed little brat. Crew wants to go out for dinner. So Jeremy invites Lowen and internally she's like, oh my God, it's like a date. They go out to dinner and crew tells jokes. So Lowen tells anti-jokes and Jeremy just finds it like so funny of course she's like quirky not like the other girls Crew scrunches up his nose you aren't very good at telling jokes at least we can rely on the honesty of children they go back to the house the outing lasted for all of two pages thank you for dinner that was fun guess I'm gonna have to take your word for it I nod in agreement slipping my hands into my back pockets the next few seconds fill the air with thick silence it's almost like that moment at the end of real dates when you can't decide between a kiss or a hug of course neither would be appropriate in this case because it wasn't a date why did it feel like one lady how many first dates have you been on with a kid tagging along I sigh heavily and then go straight to Verity's office and close the door I need to distract myself I feel an emptiness an ache in my stomach that I don't think is going to go away like I need more moments with him moments I can't get moments I shouldn't get. Considering how much time Lowen spends crushing on present Jeremy, it would be nice if we actually knew more about him other than he's attractive and grieving his daughters. That's it. I flip through the pages of Verity's manuscript, hoping to find an intimate scene with Jeremy. I'm not sure what kind of person that makes me in this moment because reading this is wrong on so many levels, but it isn't as wrong as crossing that line with him physically would be. I can't have him in real life, but I can learn what he's like in bed to aid in all my fantasies I'm probably going to have about him. What a sad little life, Lowen. So be it. Part five. Jeremy is back at work and Verity is at home with the babies all day every day. She cares for them in the morning and then during the day unplugs their monitors and goes back to sleep wearing earplugs to ignore their cries. When Jeremy comes home, she feeds and bathes them, then cooks dinner. She gets her writing done during the night whilst everyone else sleeps. It's only been a month, but Verity wants to have sex with Jeremy because she's scared of losing connection with him. The doctors tell him not to. So Verity licks his penis one night to get him so horny that he has to bang her. When I was certain I had driven him so crazy that his desire outweighed his concern for me and moved away from him he followed i fell onto my back spread my legs and he was inside me without a second thought about whether or whether or not it was too too soon for him to be there he wasn't even gentle it was as if my tongue had driven him to a point of madness because he was pounding into me so hard it actually did hurt sounds great 
I knew then it would be okay. We would be okay. Jeremy still worshipped my body as much as he always had. The girls might have taken a lot from us by then, but his desire was the one thing I knew would always be mine. Yes, I would hope that he would reserve his desire for you and not for his daughters, you strange, strange woman. Chapter 12. This chapter has been the most difficult to continue reading by far. How a mother could sleep soundly down the hall from her crying infants baffles me. She's callous. I've been under the impression that Verity might have been a sociopath, but now I'm leaning more towards psychopath. I put the manuscript away and use Verity's computer to refresh my memory of the exact definition for psychopath. I scroll through every personality trait. Pathological liar, cunning and manipulative, lack of remorse or guilt, callousness and lack of empathy, shallow emotional response. She displays every characteristic. The only thing about her that makes me question if she was a psychopath is her obsession with Jeremy. Psychopaths find it more difficult to fall in love and if they do... <sighs> Lady, you are not a psychologist. Why are you telling me all this? It's difficult for them to retain that love. They tend to move on quickly from one person to the next but Verity didn't want to move on from Jeremy. He was Verity's entire focus. Yes, it's almost as though she's mentally unwell. There's a soft knock on the office door so I minimise the screen on the computer. When I open the door, Jeremy is standing in the hallway. His hair is damp and he's wearing a white t-shirt with a pair of black pyjama bottoms. This is my favourite look on him. Barefoot, casual easygoing it's sexy as hell and i hate how attracted i am to him coho what is it with you and bare feet uh, stephanie mayer does this as well why does everyone try to romanticize feet as if they aren't objectively vile i've had enough of all of you pushing your fetishes down my throat jeremy wants to get an aquarium from the basement so crew can keep the turtle normally i would have zero desire to walk into a basement this unwelcoming especially in a house that already terrifies me but their basement is the only place in this house i've yet to see and i'm curious what's down there what kind of things could verity have packed away why are you so obsessed with that like get a life when verity's first book released we both thought it was more of a hobby than an actual career when she sold it we still didn't take it very seriously but then word started to get out and more copies of her books were selling after a couple of years her checks started to make mine look cute he laughs as if it's a fond memory and not one that bothers him at all why would it need to bother him what are you implying that he should feel emasculated because his wife is rich anyway the light in the basement goes out so Lohan gets scared and they leave Lohan goes to bed after i've washed my face and brushed my teeth i stare at the handful of shirts i bought with me that are hanging in the closet i have no desire to wear any of them so i begin to rummage through jeremy's shirts the shirt he lent me smelled like him the entire day i wore it i thumb through them until i find a t-shirt of his that's soft enough to sleep in in small print over the left breast it reads crawford realty she wears one of his t she wears one of his t-shirts to bed as if he's her boyfriend i look down at the length of the headboard and notice there is more than one imprint of teeth there are five or six areas where verity bit the headboard bffr colleen hoover some not as noticeable as the others until you're up close i crawl onto the bed and lift up onto my knees as I face the headboard. I straddle a pillow and imagine being in this position, sprawled over Jeremy's face as I grip the headboard. I close my eyes and slide a hand up to Jeremy's t-shirt, imagining it's his hand that drags on my stomach and caresses my breast. Lady, that is not your house. Put down the pillow and go to church. She gets interrupted from her little pillow sesh by hearing Verity's hospital bed moving about the cock block. I close my eyes and all that I can think about is that Verity possibly deserves the darkness, the stillness, the quiet. Yet for a psychopath, she certainly has many still wrapped around her immobile finger. Says the woman who is about to hump a pillow over a married man. Chapter 13. Lowen wakes up in Verity's bed due to sleepwalking. I just realised that the sleepwalking thing really just doesn't go anywhere either. Like it's kind of pointless. She runs off into Jeremy in the hallway, then back to her room. Jeremy follows and explains that she's a sleepwalker. And of course, she's so upset that Jeremy gives her a little cuddle. It'd be rude not to. Loan decides to leave. Jeremy takes the razor out of my hand. He places my bag of toiletries back on the counter. Then he pulls me to him, wrapping a hand around my head as he tucks me into his chest. You sleepwalk, Lo. He presses a comforting kiss into the top of my hair. You sleepwalk. It's not that big of a deal. Stop finding excuses to hug her. Like, just take off that wedding ring, dude. Lowen tells Jeremy about how she's scared of what she's capable of. I reach to the nightstand and grab my water to ease, ease the dryness in my throat. Before I continue, Jeremy places a hand on my knee, his thumb rubbing back and forth reassuringly. I stare at it as I finish telling him what happened. He does not know her well enough to be doing that platonically. At three o'clock that morning, the footage showed me walking outside onto the front porch. I climbed up onto the thin porch railing and stood there. That's all I did at first. I just stood there. For an hour, Jeremy. Germany. Germany. <sighs> we watched the entire hour, waiting, hoping to see if the footage was broken because no one should be able to remain balanced for that long. It was unnatural, but I never moved. I never spoke any words. And then I jumped. 
I must have hurt my wrist in the fall, but in the footage I showed no reaction. I pulled off the ground with both hands and then walked up the porch steps. You could see the blood already come from my hand dripping onto the porch, but my expression was dead. I walked straight back into my room and I fell asleep. That's it, by the way. That is the big re reveal of her sleepwalking 55% of the way through this book. Get alive. Her mum is scared of her after that moment because she also needs to get alive. He squeezes my hands reassuringly and then goes to the door. I feel panicked by the thought of him leaving me in here alone. Of going back to sleep. What do I do about the rest of tonight? Just lock my door? Jeremy looks at the alarm clock. It's 10 minutes to five. He stares at the clock for a moment then walks back to me. Lie down, he says, lifting the covers. I crawl into the bed and he scoots in behind me. He wraps his arms around me, tucking my head under his chin. It's almost five. I won't go back to sleep, but I'll stay until you do. So he's jumped from a slightly emotional affair to intimacy outside of his wife. Just big leap. I'm sure all of this will be justified somehow. He leaves after he thinks she's fallen asleep. Chapter 14. Jeremy asks Lowen if she wants a lock on the outside of her door instead of the inside so he can lock her in the bedroom while she sleeps. Any excuse, Colleen, to lock a woman in a room. Any excuse. It's a bit weird at this point. Lowen decides to actually do some work for once, but then she just reads more of the autobiography instead. So be it. Part 6. It had been six months since they were born and I still wish they didn't exist. But they did, and Jeremy loved them. So I tried. Sometimes I wondered if it was worth it. Sometimes I wanted to pack my bags and leave and never look back. He was the only thing stopping me from going through with it. I knew a life without Jeremy was not a life I wanted to live. I had two options. Live with him and the two girls he loved more than me. Live without him. Sounds unwell. Also, you know full well that any person who doesn't want children is automatically a villain in Colleen Hoover's eyes. She 100% has some sort of agenda going on here. Verity has a dream that Harper erases Chastin, like erases her face or something, and she is heartbroken by this dream and she wonders if she finally cares about the girls. I didn't want him to ask me that because Jeremy was good at getting my thoughts out. Most of them anyway. I didn't want him to know this one. How could I admit that I'd finally fallen in love with one of our daughters without also admitting that I'd never loved either of them to begin with? I had to do something. Preoccupied by him so he wouldn't ask too many questions. I knew from experience that Jeremy couldn't get the truth out of me if I had his dick in my mouth. Again, no one would write this in an autobiography. Who would write this? She asked Jeremy how many women before have blown him. More than 10? Maybe, possibly. Yes. It's odd how that didn't make me jealous, but two infants could leave me seething. Maybe it was because the girls were currently in his life, but all his past whores were just that. In the past. Whores? What, for having a little bit of sex? Behave. They have sex, it's dull, and the babies cries. Verity hopes it's Chastin so she can feed and cuddle her. It's Harper, so Verity ignores her and cuddles Chastin instead, suddenly in love, writing that maybe deep down she knew Chastin would die first, so the universe was telling her to give her loads of love before a short life ends. Harper keeps crying, so Verity just has the normal urge to kill her. I suddenly had this overwhelming urge to rectify what I knew was going to happen. Never in all my life had a dream been that vivid to me. I felt if I didn't do something about it in that moment, it would come true anyway, any day. For the first time, I couldn't bear the thought of losing Chastin. It hurt almost as much as the thought of losing Germany. Germany, Jeremy, Jez. I didn't know anything about ending a life, much trigger warning for this book, because it's vile. Much less the life of an infant. The one time I tried, it resulted in nothing more than a scratch, but I'd heard of SIDS, which is Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, I believe. Jezza had made me read about it. It's not uncommon, but I didn't know enough about it to know if they would be able to tell the difference between suffocation and SIDS. I'd heard of people choking in their sleep in their own vomit, though. That would probably be harder to declare an intentional act, so she tries to choke the baby with her fingers to save Chastin. This is what she would have done to her sister if I hadn't have done it first. I'm saving Chastin's life. So... To me, Colleen doesn't really have any idea what she's writing here. Because to me, Verity is having some form of postnatal psychosis. Killing one baby to save the other because she thinks that her dream was a premonition. Sounds a bit like psychosis. Not that I'm an expert, but from what I've read, it sounds a bit like psychosis to me. She's mentally unwell and she needs help. Postnatal psychosis is a, is a real thing that can happen to actual living women with disastrous consequences if it's not sp spotted fast and treated correctly. But Coho is using it as a way to demonize a woman who is dead to not want kids, question mark. Jeremy comes in, so Verity stops and Harper is saved. While I was in the bathroom, Jez made Harper a bottle. By the time I got out of the shower, she'd already fallen back to sleep. He was in our bed, plugging the video monitor back in. I froze as I was climbing into bed. I stared at the video monitor at the perfect view right into Harper and Chastin's cribs. How did I forget the fucking monitor? If he had seen what I was doing to Harper, he would have ended it with me. 
I felt like this might be important later on, but I don't think it was. I slept very little that night, wondering what Jeremy would Jeremy, Jez would have done to me if he'd caught me trying to save Chastin from her sister. Like the language used, save Chastin from her sister. It's not well. Chapter 15. Lauren is upset. She continues reading for several hours and Jeremy interrupts. I look at the clock on the computer. How did I lose track of time? I guess that happens when you're reading about a psychotic woman abusing her children. I thought it was eight. You've been in here for 12 hours, she, he says. Take a break. There's a meteor shower tonight. You need to eat and I made you a margarita. She still doesn't do any of the work that she's being paid for. Also, they said something about having tacos. I don't know why I didn't include it here, but margarita and taco tacos, I'm very sure is what Layla liked eating from the other book as well. I like who doesn't like tacos anyway? I don't drink I don't drink full stop, so I don't have margaritas. But I just think that Coho is recycling details because I mentioned it towards the end, but I'll just mention it now. This is another book where the, the climax of it is like a manuscript being read for a twist ending, which happens in November 9 as well. She's just recycling. They watch the meteor shower together, lying next to one another in the grass. <sighs> it's just an affair. No, this is just an affair. Verity hasn't spoken to her parents in a decade. They're very religious. Jeremy nods. I called them after Chastin passed, left them a voicemail. They never called back. Then when Verity had her wreck, her father actually answered the phone. When I told him what had happened to the girls and severity, he grew quiet, then said, God punishes the wicked Germany. Jez. I hung up on him. Haven't heard from them since. Seeing as Coho is religious and also believes that Verity is evil, am I right in assuming that she agrees with what Verity's parents said here? I want to tell him that he's right to be concerned because his wife's thoughts are eerily similar to her character's thoughts, but I don't want him to have that impression of her at this point. After all he's been through, he deserves to at least be able to preserve a positive memory of his marriage. You don't know this bloke, it's none of your business, so mind your own. He's watching me. Even though Jeremy and I have been making eye contact a lot tonight. It feels different in this moment. Heavier. I notice his eyes flicker towards my lips and I want him to kiss me. If he tried, I wouldn't stop him. I'm not even sure I would feel guilty. Of course you wouldn't. Lowen is all, I never get validation from writing. It would feel good if someone told me my writing matters to them. And I thought, I, I bet he says it at the end of this book to her, but Verity never read your book. I want to take a step back to mask my disappointment in the darkness, but I stay put, squeezing the doorknob with my left hand. Why would you say that if it wasn't true? He closes his eyes for a brief moment while inhaling. When he opens them, he stands up straight through his exhale. He raises his arms and grips the top of the doorframe. I'm the one who read your book, and it was good, phenomenal, which is why I suggested your name to her editor. He lowers his head a little, looking me firmly in the eye. Your writing matters to me, Lowen. Why would he lie about that in the first place? I feel like that's a red flag. Why was he lying? Like she didn't know him or Verity beforehand anyway, so what would it have mattered? Whatever. She goes to bed and gets locked in. So be it. Part seven slash nine in the context of the actual manuscript. Jez is mad at Verity for enrolling the babies in daycare without telling him because Chastin is allergic to peanuts and he thinks the daycare will be irresponsible. I know Jeremy didn't like it, but he realized we had to do something if we both wanted to continue to work. I was more successful than he was. So if anyone was going to stay at home and care for them during the day, it certainly wasn't going to be me. Coho's agenda is so real, but it just makes sense if she's the rich and the successful one. It's dinner and Jez is big mad at her, but won't tell her why. He just throws his dinner bowl at the wall. I heard him slam our bedroom door. I looked at the mess and knew I'd had to clean up after we made up so he'd know just how much I appreciated him even if he was being a major fucking douche. Mm. Verity goes after Jez who is angry that Verity only ever mentions Chastin and not Harper. It is true and I've tried to keep my mouth shut but they're getting older. Harper's going to notice you treat them differently. It isn't fair to her. If he'd read the previous chapters of this manuscript, he'd be grateful she likes one of them now at least. Verity talks her way out of it. The daycare workers think Harper should be tested for autism. You don't have to work, Jez. I make enough money for you to spend more time at home with the girls if that'll make things easier. I would go insane if I didn't work. Maybe so. But it's going to be really expensive putting three kids through daycare. We can afford. He paused, pulling back. Did you say three? I nodded. I was lying, of course, but I wanted the mood of the night to disappear. I wanted him to be happy. And he was so happy after I told him I was pregnant again. What a mess. Jez is happy so they have sex. He was thanking me for being pregnant. He made love to me with so much care, with so much compassion. It was almost worth faking the pregnancy just to have him love me like that again, to get our connection back. I can't be bothered. 
chapter 16. Another week passes, meaning Lowen has been here for all of two weeks. Two weeks is all it takes for this bloke to forget his marriage vows. I hit a wall today. I'm burnt out from working so much these past two weeks. But when? When? Lowen watches TV and tells Jez she can leave in a few days once her book outline is approved. Sometimes, especially right now, I can feel how much he's drawn to me. But then other times it seems like he works so hard to deny whatever attraction there might be between us. And I get that. I do. But is this how he's going to spend the rest of his life? Giving up huge parts of himself to care for a woman who is just a shell of the person he married? Didn't realise you were a neuroscientist. What? Incredible empathy. I understand he made vows, but at what cost? No, you don't. His entire life? It's kind of what till death do us part means. It's funny that Coho's arguing this when she's Christian. It's kind of funny. People get married and assuming they'll live long, happy lives together. What happens when one of those is cut short, but the other is expected to live out those vows for the rest of their life? Number one, he did make vows. It's none of your business. Number two, none of your business. Number three, it's not for you to decide for him. Number four, she's literally known him for like less than a month. How long has Verity been in this condition? I think that we still don't know. I think it's only a few months, but Lowen is just so eager for Verity to die off and Jeremy forget about her so they can start banging. It's wild. Lowen tells Jez she'll be 32 in an hour. I thought she was 32, okay? So Jez bakes her a cake. In all the days I've been here, this is the only second time I've actually had fun. We haven't talked about Verity or our tragedies or the contract for the past hour. While the cake was baking, I sat on the bar, my legs dangling off the edge of it. Jez leaned against the counter in front of me and we talked about movies, music, our likes and dislikes. We've actually started getting to know each other outside of everything that ties us together. She is so ready to meddle in this dude's marriage for her own gain and yet she doesn't even know. Before this conversation, she didn't know anything about him really substantial we still don't actually we don't know what movies or music or likes and dislikes he has he's just this bloke he sings happy birthday to her at midnight she blows out her candle and wishes that she can have him coho really took the saying all is fair in love and war to heart didn't she where's the decency where's the empathy where's the humanity she eats cake he puts his thumb on her lip she gets horny I hope Verity comes back to life and throws her into a lake. I'm aching everywhere because he's so close, but I don't know what I'm allowed to do about it. I want to drop my fork. Oh God, I want cake. I want him to drop the plate of cake. I want him to, don't do that, you heath, and eat the cake. I want him to kiss me, but I'm not the married one here. I don't want to make the first move and he shouldn't make the first move, but I'm desperate for him. Colleen Hoover, have you ever heard the expression, if they cheat with you, they'll cheat on you? He kisses her. So they start snogging heavily until Lowen sees Verity staring at her before Verity runs back to her room. Jez, of course, doesn't believe her initially, but then he runs off to the bedroom as well. Verity is asleep in her bed. Or is she? I bury my face into his neck, wanting the image of her out of my head. I'm sorry, I tell him. I just, maybe I haven't been getting enough sleep. Maybe I, it's my fault, Jeremy says, interrupting me. You've been working for two weeks without a break. You're exhausted. She has not. She spent the first week snooping on your wife. Lowen is a grifter. They go to Spoon in Lowen's bed because Lowen is a genius who isn't exacerbating the situation at all. Is there a chance she could be faking her injuries? He doesn't answer right away. It's almost as if he has to give the question some thought. No, he finally says. I saw the scans. But people get better. Injuries heal. I know, he says. But Verity won't fake something like this. No one would. It would be impossible. Hmm. Chapter 17. Lowen gaslights herself into thinking that she didn't actually see Verity. He had come to my office to let me know he got another lock for Verity's door this time. I thought it might help you sleep, knowing there's no way she could leave the room if that were even possible. Ah yes, if my wife is a medical marvel and is roaming around after severe brain damage, the best thing for me to do is to lock her up in her bedroom so I can continue having an affair with some woman. It's Colleen Hoover's kink. It's got to be. It would be more plausible to believe I was seeing things due to exhaustion and sleep deprivation than it would be to think a woman could fake a disability of that extent for months on end. Months. See, a few months and he's off cheating on her, forgetting his vows and pff, whatever. I'd have more empathy for him if it was a situation that had been going on for at least a year. She reads a bit more of the manuscript. So be it, part eight. Verity has a crew, the boy, does her book tours. Jez stays at home with the kids. Life is good. This is why she's the villain as well, by the way, for daring to make her husband a stay-at-home father. One day she is washing raw chicken and Jez gets a phone call about Chastin dying. On our entire drive to the hospital, I was wondering how Harper had done it. Had she smothered her like in my dream or had she come up with a more clever way to murder her sister? Again, not rational thoughts to have. She's unwell. They had been at a sleepover at their friend Maria's house. They had been there several times before and Maria, Kitty, what a silly name, knew all about Chastin 
Chastin's allergies. Chastin never travelled without her EpiPen, but Kitty had found her unresponsive that morning. She dialed 911 and then called Jeremy as soon as the ambulance took her. Somehow she accidentally ingested peanuts. Somehow. Every time I look at Harper, I could see her guilt. I had been waiting for this to happen for years. Years. I knew from when they were six months old that Harper would find a way to kill her. And what a perfect murder she committed. Even her own father would never suspect her. Her mother, though, I was a little harder to convince. And well... Isn't it telling how Colleen Hoover villainizes people who are mentally ill? Again, she did it in the co- in the Layla book with the ex-girlfriend. I miss Chastin, obviously, and I was saddened by her death. But there was something unpleasant in how hard Jeremy took it. He was devastated, numb. After she'd been dead for three months, I was growing impatient. We'd only had sex twice since her death, and he hadn't even kissed me with tongue even time. It was like he was disconnected from me, using me to get off, to feel better, to get a quick rush of something other than agony. I wanted more than that. I wanted the old Jeremy bag. I said, I don't know, come back to this. And all I said was, there's something odd about Verity's attitude towards sex. It's like she weaponizes it. Maybe I don't need to embellish more than that. Chapter 18. Verity is in the living room, not doing a whole lot. So Lowen starts throwing things near her to see if she flinches. Again, imagine she was actually brain damaged and Lowen is just doing like all of this. Lowen is busy in the kitchen, but she hears the TV go mute. So she calls Verity the bad swear word for vagina that we aren't allowed to say on YouTube. She, she yells that in this woman's face. You don't even deserve the body you're trapped in, I whisper, staring straight into her eyes. Is that foreshadowing? I hope you die with a throat full of your own vomit, the same way you attempted to kill your infant daughter. She doesn't move. I try to think of something else that would make her react, something she wouldn't be able to keep her composure after hearing. I stand up and lean into her, bringing my mouth to her ear. Jeremy is going to fuck me in your bed tonight. Bit far, innit, mate? Homewrecker. Verity wheezes herself in response. Again, imagine if Verity actually was disabled and Lowen has just been, like, bullying her. Wouldn't the story be a lot darker then the protagonist is really the uh, the antagonist the old switcheroo that verity is incontinent has to wear diapers and be bathed makes me feel even sorrier for him jeremy is now taking her upstairs to do both those things it makes me angry angry at verity surely her current state is a result of the terrible human she's been to her to her children and to jeremy now for the rest of her life jeremy will have to suffer the consequences of verity's karma hmm surely her current state is a you know there are people who are actually in like that state for real right what are you trying to say that they deserve it can't like what are you saying colleen stop it but again it's still not her marriage and none of her business lowen tries to convince jeffs to shove verity off in a care home she's like be selfish do what you want and he's like all i want is you he takes her to her bedroom locks them inside they get naked and stare at each other i don't have a condom he says as he cuts my ass and pulls me against him i'm not on the pill my words don't prevent him from lifting me and lowering me to the bed his lips circle my left nipple briefly and then brush across my mouth as he hovers over me i'll pull out idiots they have sex i feel weak against his strength his arms effortlessly moving me around the bed every few minutes i realize in all the times i've read about intimacy of his wife she always had to have some form of control over him i relinquish all my control to the agenda big evil verity was emasculating her husband by being sexually confident because <laughs> real women good women anyway good women have to be total submissives to their husband. She also rides his face and bites the headboard just like Verity did. Even during sex, Verity is living rent-free in this woman's head. Is she banging Jeremy out of spite? Who knows? I can feel Verity's teeth marks beneath mine, different unaligned with my own bite i bite harder into the wood as i come determined to leave deeper marks than she ever did determined to think of only of jez and me every time i look at this headboard in the future also that's a that's quite presumptuous that is quite a presumption right future and this presumptuous and it is a wooden headboard so how the hell are they biting so hard and yet not like ripping their teeth out on it chapter 19 they have sex in the shower and then have pillow talk i loved her she was my wife, but sometimes I wasn't sure we really knew each other. We lived together, but it's as if our worlds weren't connected. He reaches up and touches my lips, tracing over them with the tips of his fingers. I was insanely attracted to her, which I'm sure you don't want to hear, but it's true. Our sex life was great, but the rest of it, I don't know. I felt like there was something missing in the beginning, but I stayed and I married her and we started our family because I always believed that deeper connection was within reach. I thought I'd wake up one day and look her in the eyes and it would click like that mythical puzzle piece that finally snapped into place. Sure, it's a different view to what we've been reading in the manuscript, but also I felt like there was something missing in the beginning. So I stayed with her and married her and had a family because I thought we could get a deeper connection. You know, he's still not like, even if she is evil and the manuscript is true. Oops, 
I'm spoiling the ending. You know, like, that's not a good thing to do. To start a whole ass family of someone you don't feel... And, like, marry someone you don't feel, a, like, a connection with. What are you talking about? But maybe if he'd paid more attention, he would have realised his wife needs serious help. It's not lost on me that he mentioned loving her in the past tense. Did you eventually find that connection? No, not like I had hoped. But I felt something close to it. A fleeting intensity that proved a deeper connection can exist. When was that? Several weeks ago, he says quietly, in a random coffee shop bathroom with a woman who wasn't my wife. Bollocks. They fall asleep and when they wake, they find they are locked in the bathroom. Lowen expresses fear that Verity has locked them in and taken crew. So Je Jez smashes the window and unlocks the door from the outside. Everyone else in the house is asleep. So be it. Part nine. Verity is complaining about her lack of sex life again and complaining about Harper killing Chastin. She makes Harper cry. She takes Harper and crew to the lake to spend the day outside. They get in a boat and paddle across the lake. Verity capsizes the boat and takes crew back to the shore, leaving Harper there. She drowns. One person was in the water looking for her, then two, then three. Then I felt someone fly past me onto the dock. He ran to the end and jumped in head first. When he popped up, I saw that it was Jeremy. I can't describe the look on his face he used to yell for her. It was a look of determination mixed with horror mixed with psychosis. So Coho is aware of what psychosis is? Huh. I was crying real tears at that point. I was hysterical. I wanted to smile at how appropriately hysterical I was, but I didn't because part of me knew I had messed up. I could see it in Je Jez's face. This one would be even harder of him to recover for from than Chastin. I didn't anticipate that. What a mess. Chapter 20. Lowen goes to throw up after reading this, then does nothing but drinks a shot and falls asleep. Useless. Jez wakes up mainly because he wants sex. He tells Lowen that a nursing facility will take Verity and allow her home three weekends a month. So Lowen is like, well, best not tell him about the manuscript then because it just won't do any good it's not like he would have a right to know except all she's wanted to do since she found the manuscript is show it to him and now she's changed her mind i guess because their own sex lowen just decides eh the facility will have cameras set up and i'm sure they will catch her moving about she's leaving the hard work to everyone else just like how she hasn't written the books yet either they have sex again and this time he doesn't pull out lives with bloke for like two weeks why do all of these characters make terrible decisions bet she gets pregnant from this too he's literally known her for about a month which is not long enough to decide on making a whole ass human together idiots so these authors realize that babies aren't just accessories you can have because they're cute and you can't give them like stupid names because then they need to grow up and deal with the repercussions of having stupid names and you know they're going to grow up and have opinions that are different from yours and they're going to be their own people Does it like most of these people even realize that i don't think so they just treat them like little dolls that manuscript is definitely fucking with my head i feel like i'm falling in love with the man and i've only known him for a few weeks but i'm not only falling in love with him in real life i've fallen in love with him because of verity's words didn't she complain about that Corey guy doing the the exact same thing with her at the beginning of the novel he deserves to be with someone who will put her love for his children before anything else i pull the pillow off my face and place it under my hips lifting them so that everything he just left inside me doesn't seep out that is actually mental are you just desperate what's going on chapter 21 i dreamt about crew when i fell back asleep he was older about 16 nothing significant happened in my dream or at least if it did i can't remember it i only remember the feeling i had when i looked into his eyes like he was evil which is funny because he's been fine all this point up until now it's like coho remembered she wanted to have like a little creepy kid thing and then nothing really happens after this chapter or so until the extra chapter that she put out months after publication i only remember the feeling i had when i looked into his eyes like he was evil it was as, as if everything verity had put him through and everything he'd seen was embedded into his soul and he carried with that with him through childhood okay so not only does colleen hoover not how like men not know how mental illnesses work i guess she doesn't know how trauma works either because it sounds like she's being like oh he's traumatized so he's just gonna be evil blah this woman she's driving me crazy crow is playing on his ipad because he's an ipad kid what are you playing? I ask him. Toy Blast? At least it's not Fallout or Grand Theft Auto. There's hope for him yet. Firstly, what the fuck do you mean? He's like five. Why would he be playing those games anyway? Secondly, Fallout is a great game and you are just jealous you could never create stories as good as Fallout New Vegas. Hoover. Lone begins interrogating Crew to work out if he's messed up from the day on the lake. I don't feel that she should be doing that with a five-year-old. Crew's eyes flick back to mine. He pulls the knife out of his mouth for a moment, long enough to say, mummy said I shouldn't talk to you if you ask me questions about her. I think he's eating food. And that's why he has a knife. But then he accidentally bites the butter knife once he realizes his mistake. So I, maybe it's not even an accident. I think he does it as some kind of trauma response. I don't know. The kid also needs help. Maybe if Jeremy wasn't so busy sticking his dick in a woman that isn't his wife, he'd notice that his kid needs help. Starts bleeding. 
Mouth starts bleeding. Jess takes Crew to the hospital for stitches and leaves Lerman with Verity. Lerman locks Verity in her room and grabs the baby water. So at least something interesting is happening now. We're basically at the end of the book and the thriller aspect is coming in. She puts the baby monitor in Verity's room and then watches for any movement. With nothing else to do, she reads the manuscript. So be it, part 10. It's the aftermath of Harper's death, speaking to the police, etc. Finally, after several minutes of silence, he said, it just doesn't make sense. What doesn't make sense? He pulled back, putting space between my face and his chest. He wanted me to look at him, so I lifted my head. He touched my cheek gently with the back of his fingers. Why would you tell Crew to hold his be- breath, Verity? That's the moment I knew it was over. Like, as she capsized the boat, she told him, hold your breath. Am I at the end of my story? I don't know what happens next. Unlike my prediction of Chastin's murder, I don't know how my life will end. Will it be at the hands of Jez? Or will it be at my own hand? Or maybe it won't end at all. Maybe Jez will wake up tomorrow and see me sleeping next to him. Maybe he'll remember all the good times, all the blowjobs, all the swallowing. <laughs> And he'll realise how much more time we'll have to do those things now we only have one child. (laughs) If that's the case, so be it. I'll just drive my car into a tree. The end. Well, she's a woman of her word then. Chapter 22. He suspected her? I squeezed my neck trying to ease all the tension that last chapter infused into my muscles. How could he still take care of her? Bathe her and change her for the rest of her life. Feels like he owes her the promise of his vows. If he truly thought she had killed Harper, how could he stand to be in the same house as her? I thought then, well, maybe he actually didn't write the manuscript himself. Jez gets home, goes for a shower. Lowen notices Verity moving around on the baby monitor. Like an idiot, Lowen just starts screaming instead of filming the evidence so Verity gets back into bed. Lowen then goes to Verity's room, begins pulling out the bed, but Jeremy stops her angry. Jeremy doesn't believe Lowen and he starts to pack her suitcase. Lowen gives him the manuscript. And again, this is another book ending with someone knowing the truth via a manuscript. November 9th, Coho is recycling her own climaxes, which is, I guess, economical of her. Chapter 24. Jeremy reads the part about Harper and goes to Verity's room. Lowen watches via baby monitor. He threatens her with the police and she opens her eyes. He grabs her by the leg and yanks her back onto the bed. When she starts to scream, he covers her mouth. They struggle. She's trying to kick him. He's holding her down. Then his other hand forms a circle around her throat. He almost strangles Verity, but Lowen intervenes, so they plot to kill her together. (laughs) <laughs> you have to make it look like an accident, I say. This is quite a leap. My voice quiet, yet loud enough to be heard over the noises she's making beneath the palm of his hand. Make her vomit. Cover her nose and mouth until she stops breathing. It will look like she asp- aspirated in her sleep. This is a mile a minute. This is where all the thriller aspect has been. Jeremy puts his fingers down Verity's throat like Verity tries to do to Harper and she dies. I changed my mind. Wild. Best story ever. They planned to tell everyone she just died in her sleep despite, you know, he did strangle her before doing this. So there would be strangulation marks and he did put his fingers down her throat. So I guess there would be DNA, but who cares? Who cares, right? Chapter 24. A whole seven months later. Everyone believes them. The outline was approved. Lone finally does some work and writes the first draft of the first novel. And she's pregnant because that just solves everything, doesn't it, Colleen Hoover? Randomly getting knocked up with a man you basically just met and murdered someone with. It's a bonding experience, I guess. Jezza sells the house and buys a new house in South Carolina. However, Lowen, one day, they're back at the old house. She finds a letter for Jeremy kept hidden in Verity's room under a floor panel. Dear Jeremy. The letter is about how their lives were perfect until Chastin's death, but Verity knows where it all went wrong. I was expressing my concerns to Amanda because I wasn't sure which angle to take with a new book. Should I write something completely different or should I stick to the same formula of writing from the villain's point of view that made my first novel so successful? She suggested I stick to the same formula, but she also wanted me to take even more risks with the second book. I told her it was difficult for me to make a voice in my novel sound authentic when it wasn't at all how I think in my everyday life. I was worried I wouldn't be able to improve my craft with the next book. That's when she told me to try an exercise she learned in grad school called antagonistic journaling. That's where this is going. She said antagonistic journaling was the best way to improve my craft. She said I needed to get into the mind of an evil character by writing journal entries from my own life, things that really happened, but to make my inner dialogue in the journal entry be the opposite from what I was actually thinking at the same time. She told me to start by writing about the day you and I met. That would make more sense than her starting an autobiography by just like her meeting Jeremy. She said I should write down what I was wearing, where we met and what our conversation was that night, but to make my inner dialogue more sinister than actually was. As soon as we got back to our place, I went straight to my laptop and wrote about the first night we met. 
I pretended my red dress was stolen in my alternate version. I, do you know the problem with Colleen Hoover as well is she totally hand holds. Like she could have, she's hand holding us right now for it. Like we, we get it. Verity's version is it was all just a writing exercise. I pretended I was there to hopefully fuck rich men, which was absolutely not true. You should know me better than that, Jeremy. Well, you'd think so. He's only been married to her for X amount of years. You'd think you'd know it better than that. Verity writes all of her important milestones, but as a villain. By the time I had finished my third novel, I felt I had mastered the craft of writing from a point of view that wasn't mine at all. The exercises had helped me so much, I decided to combine all of my journal entries into an autobiography that could be used to teach other authors how to master their craft. I needed to tie the chapters together with an overall storyline so the autobiography was more cohesive, so I pushed the envelope with every scene to make it more jarring, more disturbing. I don't regret writing it because my only intention was to eventually help other writers, but I do regret writing about Harper's death just days after it happened. My mind was in such a dark space though, and sometimes as a writer, the only way to clear your mind is to let the darkness spill out onto a keyboard. It was my therapy, no matter how hard that may be for you to understand. Letter Verity is asking Jeremy why he read the manuscript when he never reads her stuff and then she details what actually happened that it was an accident she told crew to hold his breath as the canoe tipped to try to help him survive she thought Harper would be okay but 30 seconds was all it took for her to you know be dragged under and die anyway Verity had used her writing exercises as catharsis nothing more but then Jeremy snoops one day and read it all Jez strangles her until she passes out and she wakes up in her Range Rover tied up without a seatbelt and crashes into a tree like with him driving the car thinking the last bit of the manuscript script is the perfect alibi but she survives she's in a coma for a while and then she comes out for three days i pretended to still be in a coma when anyone would enter my room doctors nurses you crew but i was careless one day and you caught me with my eyes open as you worked wa- walked into the hospital room you stared at me i stared back i saw your fist clench as if you were pissed that i'd woken up as you as if you wanted to walk over and wrap your fingers from me. like you never even gave her a chance to explain herself at all just jumped straight to trying to murder her once he read it and then did murder her once yeah you took a few steps towards me but i decided not to follow you with my eyes because your rage terrified me if i pretended not to be aware of my surroundings in that moment there was a chance you wouldn't try to end my life again a chance you wouldn't go to the police and tell them i had recovered this is messy she fakes her injuries after that. I don't think it wasn't hard. It was humiliating at times. I wanted to give up, kill myself, kill you. I was so angry at where our lives had ended up. And after all those years of marriage, you could even for one second believe any of that manuscript to be true. I mean, seriously, Jeremy, do men really believe that women are that obsessed with sex? It was fiction. This is why I believe her. Because like the manuscript is very men writing women. This is why I believe letter. Like, I mean, I don't really care that much, but I do believe letter verity because I think it makes it a lot more darker. <laughs> and Lowen is a complete hapless idiot. So it makes more sense that she would just end up an accessory to straight up murder. There have been moments throughout the past few months where I've wanted to tell you I'm here, that it's me, that I'm okay, but it'd be a waste of breath. We can't get past two murder attempts, Jeremy. And I know if you find out I'm faking this one before I'm able to leave, your third attempt at killing me will be successful. He's the dangerous one and Lowen's having the baby with him. She planned to run away with crew. She wrote the letter whilst Jeremy and Lowen were having sex. She ends it by saying, even though you tried to kill me, you're still a wonderful husband. Colleen, Hoover in what universe in what universe would a woman like be this much of a stop it chapter 25 Lowen is gobsmacked I can't wait to see how Hoover justifies this one Lowen decides to flush the letter down the toilet and even eat some of the paper to make sure Jeremy doesn't find out because we can't have a man being responsible for any of his actions now can we we have to protect the fragile little um man folk from the consequences of their own actions jez would never forgive himself never if he found out the manuscript wasn't real and that verity had never harmed harper he wouldn't be able to survive that kind of truth the truth that he murdered his innocent wife that we murdered his innocent wife but if lowen believes the letter is true and the manuscript is false then how could she just stay with jez like knowing that he didn't hear his wife of x amount of years out and jumped straight to murdering her like three times also if letter verity is true remember how jeremy went on about how he'd never actually felt a real connection to verity but he just felt one to lowen someone he'd just met he's the villain and look before you don't believe me wait until we get to the extra chapter because he's definitely the villain i have no idea what to believe so why put him through more anguish verity could have written that letter as a way to try and cover her tracks it could have been another ploy at manipulating the situation and everyone involved well why would she write this weird autobiographical manuscript if it wasn't a writing exercise because it is mental to write out like all of these 
crazy things. And even if Jez really was the reason for her wreck, I can't blame him. He believed Verity maliciously murdered his child. I can't even blame him for ultimately, f how are you gonna justify this as that? Well, even if she was innocent, I still can't blame him for murdering her and not hearing out his wife. I can't even blame him for ultimately following through of her murder when he found out she had been deceiving him about her, her injuries. Any parent in his position would have done the same, should have done the same. What, should have just like jumped to straight up murder? No investigation, not, not even asking her. That's what he should have done. Just straight up gone, nope, you're a murderer and I'm gonna kill you before you even have a chance to talk. We both believed in our hearts that she was a threat to crew to us no matter which way i look at it it's clear that verity was a master at manipulating the truth the only question that remains is which truth was she manipulating but if letter verity is the correct one the only people who did a murder was lowen and lowen and jez so how can she sit there and be like no it's fine it's fine then it just ends i don't understand how could she can justify this i remember coho has said in an interview that she thinks that verity is the evil one which again let me get to the extra chapter she added the acknowledgements for this my favorite group on facebook colleen hoover's cohorts we're close to eighty thousand members now Yet it still feels like such a close-knit community. When someone is having a bad day, you encourage them. When someone can't afford a book, you help them. Yeah, and when someone criticizes you, you weaponize them. Number nine, E.L. James. Your successful career does not impress me nearly as much as your soul. You're amazing in so many ways, but my favorite thing about you is the love and appreciation you have for your readers. You set a great example to authors everywhere. This suddenly explains so much. To every one of you reading these acknowledgements, whether you're here because you hate this book or here because you love it, the important thing is that you are reading. Thank you for that. Now that you've finished this one, go devour another one. Don't tell me what to do. And also I would read, I would rather read nothing than this. I think the whole, well, at least they're reading is such a cop-out argument. And it's also such a, like the bar is on the floor. I don't care if people think I'm being snobby and elitist or whatever, because the media that we consume affects us. We internalize it. So maybe we should be conscious of what we're consuming. And it's nothing against there being evil, ca like evil characters are so compelling when they're done right. But Coho doesn't seem to understand when she's actually writing evil characters and she's not. And it's confusing. She romanticizes abusive men. I don't think that's good for people. I'd rather they didn't like bother reading than read more schlock of abusive men being romanticized. Maybe I'm crazy, I don't know. There's a bonus chapter, right, that was released after this was initially published. Someone put it on Reddit and I just, I didn't put screenshots because I'm gonna be bothered by it. So it's Lowen saying, as soon as her kid Nova was born, she realized that either way, Verity was sick in the head for either doing the killings or writing about them as a exercise as catharsis. Except it's obviously way worse to actually do killings, you big loser. Like she's convinced that Verity was dangerous either way, except you know, one is words and the other is actual murder. Be quiet, you pearl clutcher, nonsense. So she's all, Verity deserved it, you know, no matter what, even if she didn't do the killings, she still deserved it for doing some writing so she deserved to die for doing some shut up loan finds herself in competition with verity verity is dead and she's still the main character living rent free i love verity for causing loan so much pain even beyond the grave loan is now obsessed with pleasing jeremy to be just like book verity jeremy is reading the book of another author and she's pretty so loan is very jelly mad she's very um worried that well what if jeremy decides to meet up with her and she likes her best friend oh, this is what you get huh they cheat with you they're gonna cheat on you <laughs> obviously not all the time but i think that's a bit pretty pretty like decent rule to go but i mean don't, don't assume that you're going to be the exception to that one which even then you know sometimes we're all human sometimes you end up having feelings for the wrong person shit happens that's life it's important to feel remorse if you do things that hurt other people though lauren don't feel none of that she's like well i'm glad she's dead <laughs> yeah there's a scene where lauren jez sorry there's a scene where jez tastes lauren's breast milk i don't need to know about that keep it in the bedroom guys lowen and crew don't really get on much he doesn't care about his baby sister because he thinks that she's just going to die anyway like everyone else in his life has lowen is very paranoid no one knows about her and jezza being together so that it doesn't look you know suspicious they have to live a life of constantly lying to everyone sounds exhausting they go to a beach and patricia from the grocery store sees them and knows who she is she remembers them 
as in remembers who Lowen is. Do they live in North Carolina or South Carolina? Because I think it said South Carolina earlier, but here it says North Carolina. Who knows? Whatever. The, so the, a lady from Vermont just randomly is at the same place in North Carolina as her old name. Okay, sure. Patricia is quite suspicious of the situation because she's the be- she sees the baby and stuff. So she leaves and Jeremy worries that he and Lowen are going to get rumbled and people might look more into Verity dying in her sleep because everyone just accepted that, right? Then murders her, murders the neighbor, murders Patricia, doesn't speak to her, just straight up drowns her. Oh, suddenly looks like Jeremy is the true villain of this book, which, okay, is weird because in Coho's head, Verity is the villain and Jez and Lowen are the good guys, but then he does this. I don't I don't understand who she wrote this for because people who liked Jez and Lowen can't possibly stand behind him being fine with murdering not one, but like two women at this point, right? I don't know who she's written this for. I don't understand the target audience of this extra chapter. Uh, Lowen just allows it, by the way. She's just like, it's either us or her, okay? You can't just kill anyone and everyone who recognizes you. It's wild. Lowen is now scared of Jeremy, but still justifies it as, oh, but he's just looking out for his family, heart eyes. Shut up. She says, boy, I hope we live a low key life from now on and we're never forced to murder again. No one's forcing you, you pair of wrong uns. Anyway, to prove that she loves him, she gives him a blowjob in the shower. Okay. But she's also terrified that he's going to turn on her one day. I mean, we already know that he murdered Verity. And now he's murdered this random neighbor apropos of basically nothing. Who's to say that he didn't kill people before Verity? All right, because he's done like two murders. And look, it's either this way, either letter Verity was right and the whole thing was a writing exercise or manuscript Verity was right and she was severely mentally unwell. Doesn't look good for Jeremy, does it? They have sex and she's still just comparing herself to Verity, but not even the real Verity, the manuscript Verity. Nova is missing. Like they have sex, they kind of says, Nova's missing. She was crying too much, so Crew put her outside on the grass. I think Lowen's gonna end up killing Crew. What is going on? In the end, basically everyone has been driven kind of insane. What did I just read? Like, okay, so personally, I... I like that everyone's kind of driven insane by it because it's sort of like, well, that's what you get for cheating with a married man, getting pregnant after like knowing um, the married man for less than a month and also committing murder with this man that you've known for less than a month. Maybe that's what you get. Maybe like attracts like. I kind of, I don't understand who she wrote this for because for people who believe Lauren and Jez, this surely must be an annoying ending because there's no way that Jez is justifiable in murdering the neighbor. There's there's no justifiable way. And if he's killed so easily within what? Like a year of the original book's ending, he's going to do it again. He's already got two under his belt. He's gonna do it again. My thoughts on the actual book. The level of suspending your disbelief this novel requires to be passable in plot is insane. We are meant to believe that Verity would not tell Jeremy about the writing exercise autobiography or or maybe write down at the beginning, this is a writing exercise, or password protect any of her stuff. Which, okay, so she wrote it on a computer and then it was printed out into a manuscript. I don't really understand what's going on there. Fine, let's say we do believe that, right? We do believe that she just wouldn't mention it because he never takes an interest in her books, whatever. Even though like, this is something that if you were writing as an exercise, you would tell your partner, hey, I'm doing something and it seems really fucked up, but just hear me out. It's a writing exercise. You would, in case they found it and got the wrong impression, you just would. So the suspension of disbelief required that Jeremy would just automatically assume it's all true and that his wife is capable of killing her child, that then Verity would be able to fool doctors and nurses and everyone for months just by staying really still. That Lowen would take forever to read this autobiography. She takes like two weeks to read it just to lengthen out the story, even though it's something that you could probably read in less than a day. That Lowen wouldn't just tell Jeremy about the manuscript immediately and leave. That Lowen would let a man she's basically just met jizz inside her and then do her best to get the sperm to wiggle its way to the egg. That alone, if you did that to a bloke and you've known them for less than a month, unless they have some sort of breeding fetish, that would make a man if he found out about that run for the hills that jeremy was so mad at verity he would just kill her without letting her explain right so the first time it was attempted murder the second the actual murder right that he would do that right but he wouldn't just off her in the months she was in a non-community 
communicative state. If he's that mad that he killed her without letting her talk to him, mate, he would have, not to be too graphic, he would have put a pillow over her head during all the months that he was pretending to care for her, still look after her. Why would he keep up the dutiful husband role if he was that mad at her truly he would have killed her and then pretended that she died in her sleep like the same way that he's done here we're still suspending our disbelief here that low in self-esteem is so bad she would go from being a person with a very average life to i'm going to stay with and assist a murderer so i can be with a man i've known for a month bollocks that patricia would coincidentally see them in north carolina all the way from vermont i don't like, i really don't believe that america's a big place dude what are the chances Wait, also, also, when Lowen catches Verity out, she tries to pull her out of the bed, right? Because she's angry. She wants, you know, her like, to prove that Verity's moving around. But when Jeremy sees Lowen trying to pull Verity out of the bed, he gets mad at her for this and tries to throw her out of the house. And yet he already read the manuscript and thought Verity was a murderer. So why would he care that Lowen is trying to do... The characters are two-dimensional and insufferable. We actually know nothing about Jeremy beyond he has a magic penis that makes all the women go crazy and that he likes to murder women and we know nothing about Lowen except that she's an idiot the sleepwalking thing I thought that was going to be a bigger thing than it actually was it, it isn't it's just kind of used as a convenient plot device to have the locks on the doors so things can happen the twist ending it's like Colleen Hoover thought of the twist first and then wrote a story around it. The twist exists just for there to be a twist. I've been talking so much that my jaw is about unhinged as well. Colleen Hoover cannot handle serious topics, so I don't know why she continues to write about them. The portrayal of mental illnesses and disabilities, to me, is rather telling. The vilification of women who don't automatically bond with their pregnancy or newborns, despite it happening more often than you'd think, versus the glorification of Jeremy because he has a paternal bond despite being a cheat and murderer. A serial killer, if you include bonus chapter the way coho obviously wants us to think that verity is evil because she wasn't suited to parenthood but lowen is good because she had maternal instincts for nova also the boring sex scenes it's non-stop and gratuitous this is the real reason people like colleen hoover i think it's just smut dressed up as something more and i don't care about smut technically i've written and published my own erotica right but just don't pretend to be something you're not and when i think back to the way that i saw some people go on about this i thought it was going to be like a detective murder mystery i don't know why i had that impression it's literally the exact same as her normal romance stories except there's just a bit of murder thrown in the only positive thing i can say about this is that this is the perfect thriller for people who enjoy colleen hoover if you enjoy colleen hoover whatever like i don't actually care that much i do these videos mainly to torture myself and to entertain my audience but i need you to try to understand that I don't think people would go quite as hard at her if she wasn't so vastly overhyped. And I feel that Colleen Hoover believes that anyone who doesn't want children is cracked in the head and just capable of like trying to murder infants. The irony is that it's ambiguous as to whether Verity did kill Harper. It's left up to you, the audience, to decide. Do you want to read the believe the manuscript or do you want to believe the letter? And yet the doting paternal father is a murderer. It's canon. Does it twice. Ryle from It Ends With Us also didn't want kids until Lily just has a kid. And he's also this abusive, psychotic person. And I don't think that's a coincidence in Coho's world. The people who don't want kids are psychos. If Manuscript Verity never wanted children, why wasn't she on the pill? Hmm? Colleen Hoover? Oh wait, because that's not convenient for your whole story. The extra chapter. I saw people say that Colleen Hoover clearly went online, saw all of the criticisms of Jeremy, and then quickly wrote the extra chapter as a way to be all, see guys, I knew he was bad too. They did that on purpose. I don't know if that's the case, but that's kind of my head kind of now. Also to know, I skip past a lot of the genuine bad writing and cliches because other people are better at pulling stuff like that apart, you know, like Rachel Oates and her channel. Whereas sometimes when I read like bad writing or whatever, I swear that my eyes just kind of glaze over and my brain doesn't absorb the information. Like the cliches and stuff, it just, it, I'm numb to it. It doesn't really go in. But I certainly noticed the difference when I read this and then I read A Clockwork Orange or I've been reading Dead Souls by uh, Nikolai Gogo. <laughs> certainly a difference. Well, Clockwork Orange is a classic and Nikolai Gogo is a Russian, like nine, I think 19th century author. So maybe that's not so fair to, maybe that's not as fair to compare romance it's kind of a thriller though considering coho thinks this is a thriller there's certainly a difference when you read this versus any thriller that stephen king 
has written. Maybe that's a more fairer comparison. Marianne Keys, Grown Ups. I guess it's women's fiction, right? So maybe this is more of a fair comparison, f- even fairer comparison. But this, I enjoyed, re- I remember enjoying reading this. So there's certainly a difference to note when reading Colleen Hoover versus a lot of fiction out there. And I I'd still, even though I've like spoken through my feelings, I'm still none the wiser as to who the extra chapter is actually aimed towards. Cause it like, it must have pissed off her fan base. I don't know, whatever, I'm done with this. Thank you guys so much for watching and suffering through another long, long video. Let me know what you want me to cover next. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, check out my podcast channel. I'm doing a Gilmore Girls review series with Rachel Oates. Check out my mockumentary when that's out and I'll see you guys next time. That's all. Cheers, mates. Bye.